Welcome everybody. Just a moment. There we go. That looks like we've got a title slide up there, right? Just giving a few minutes for everybody to jump in. Maya, if you can watch the uh, sign-ins and when it looks like we've got a little slowdown, I will get started. Recording in progress. And again, I'll just let all the panelists know that if they would like to mute and turn off their camera until they're speaking, that's up to them and it's just fine. I will have my camera off, but I am in audio. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Hey Maya, what's it look like? Uh, people are joining a little slower. Um, do you think you could try resharing your slides? Oh. I have a comment saying it's a little bit tiny. Oh, well, we'll try that again. What does that look like? Still the same. Um, it could be the slide as well. <laughs> okay. I think uh, it's okay. Let me try one more thing. It seems to continue to want to. I think it's okay. Screen. All right. Well, do our best here. All right. Very good. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, Thanks everyone for uh, coming and uh, attending today's uh, webinar on maximizing transportation assets by building community connection through innovative development of rights of way and airspace. Uh, this is a case study workshop and symposium. We will have a chance to uh, hear from all of you who are attending as well as uh, a number of speakers talking about the topic. Um, it's, uh, it's a very wordy title, but I think probably the most important ones are innovative and rights of way. Um, and we're talking about transportation as well. 
Uh, I am Frank Dauma, a researcher at the University of Minnesota and the principal investigator on this uh, research that we will be uh, presenting today. And uh, uh, want to um, uh, first of all say that, uh, a thank you to all of our speakers and uh, appreciation for everyone to uh, participate in this virtual format. As we've been pulling this event together, uh, I've been increasingly feeling like if this had been done in person, we probably would have started with dinner last night and talked all the way through a full eight hour day today. Um, but uh, uh, to uh, maintain everybody's uh, interest, um, we've squeezed it down to uh, three hours or so uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the virtual format. Uh, what that has done is given us a chance to reach a very wide audience. Uh, we have um, uh, over 100 uh, registrants, if I counted right at the last, uh, last check. Uh, and uh, it's people from uh, University of Minnesota students, uh, other researchers uh, and faculty at the University of Minnesota, to uh, planners from all levels of government, from uh, smaller cities to big cities, to state DOTs, to uh, even uh, some guests from the federal government uh, are attending. So we should have a very broad uh, uh, set of uh, perspectives here and uh, are very glad that you've all been able to participate. So uh, this is the proposed schedule for today. Uh, we will have uh, Peter Park as our uh, first speaker. Uh, as soon as I am done. Then we will hear from case studies in Atlanta and Milwaukee. Um, then we'll have Paul Angelone from ULI as our uh, next keynote, and then a case study from Washington, D.C. Um, between uh, the, uh, the end of the first case, cases and Paul's presentation, we will have about 10 minutes for, for Q&A. We will also have about 10 minutes uh, at two o'clock for Q&A of uh, Paul and uh, the 11th Street Bridge uh, presenter. And uh, I want to point out that uh, um, the way we will seek uh, your, your feedback for Q&A is if you use that Q&A button uh, on uh, your, uh, your Zoom screen down at the bottom uh, center, uh, if your screen resembles mine. Uh, we will be monitoring those, and uh, Maya or I will pass the questions on uh, as we're able to, uh, to do so. Uh, then we will go into a workshop activity. We have three questions set to go in a Qualtrics format. I'll provide the URL at that time uh, for folks to go in and uh, give their answers. Um, and uh, we'll present those results shortly thereafter. Uh, have a little more chance for discussion uh, among everyone. Again, uh, submitting your questions and comments through the Q&A. Uh, then uh, to close out, um, well, I, I skipped probably the key part, which is uh, at 1.50, we'll be presenting the results of our research, which is uh, the best practices that we have found uh, from looking at these and other cases. Um, then we'll have that workshop activity and discussion. Then uh, a, local, a leader of a local innovative use, uh, 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 Keith Baker from Reconnect Rondo, will talk about how closely our experience, our lessons have fit with his experience. Uh, and uh, then finally, um, we will have a, a summary provided by uh, Cyrus Knudsen from the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, we do give MnDOT the chance to tell you what happens next because uh, this is research that is funded by uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Uh, we are conducting it uh, as independent academics here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we do report our uh, results as we've been going to a technical advisory panel. Their purpose is for rigor and seeking implementation opportunities uh, throughout the state. Uh, but the findings, the draft findings that we will present are ours here at the University of Minnesota and do not uh, represent any views of, uh, of MnDOT. Uh, our method here is uh, case study research looking at innovative uses of rights of way. We looked at uh, looking at uh, adjacent uses, uh, freeway caps, uh, underbridge, and, uh, and as you'll hear, even uh, freeway removal. The project has been about 18 months. 
Uh, and we'll hear, the, as I've mentioned, the firsthand presentations from select cases and our draft best practices and lessons learned. Finally, I do want to uh, thank the Minnesota APA. They've applied for uh, up to three continuing um, uh, maintenance credits uh, for those who are AICP. And uh, so if, uh, if that is you, um, we will uh, be, uh, that, that application is in process. And uh, if you have any questions, you can either uh, uh, check with the Minnesota APA or you may uh, contact us and we can uh, get that information connected. So I mentioned it's case studies. Uh, we uh, will be hearing from three, but we actually, which I just highlighted, the Sweet Auburn uh, area in Atlanta, uh, the Park East Freeway, and also uh, I-794 uh, in, uh, in Milwaukee, and uh, the 11th Street Bridge. But we also looked at the Claiborne uh, Cultural Innovation District in New Orleans, the uh, Solar Gardens uh, in Oregon, um, the Central 70 project in Denver, the I-579 cap in Pittsburgh, uh, and then also the Capitol crossing in Washington, DC. And we'll talk a little bit more about even the ones that are not presented today in some detail uh, when we get to the findings. Uh, the way we uh, have done our research is uh, we uh, looked at six different areas for each of the cases, stakeholder engagement, governance, uh, finance strategies, uh, community and economic development, um, impacts on human and natural environment and health, and finally design features and placemaking. That has led to seven uh, lessons and best practices, which as I mentioned, we will present later. So uh, that concludes uh, my uh, portion of the presentation today um, until we get to the, uh, the best practices. Uh, I would like to uh, turn it over to uh, Peter Park and uh, I will uh, give him a proper introduction in just a moment. Um, my, we do have uh, bios for all of the speakers uh, of, um, put together. And Maya, if you are able to share that link uh, in, in, in the chat for those who can see it, um, that would be uh, quite useful. Um, and I am playing a few games with my computer screen here. So. Just a second. Okay. I have my screen up that has the uh, uh, invitation, the uh, introductions. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, that screen has gone black on me. Um, I will take advantage of Maya's resharing. Should also point out Maya Sheik is the, uh, uh, or excuse me, it's Maya Sheik. She's been working with me for a year now on the. Uh, project, graduate research assistant, graduate student here at the Humphrey School. Um, and one last administrative note is that we are uh, recording this webinar um, and uh, we'll be uh, keeping it uh, available for uh, not broadcast, uh, but for those who may follow up with questions, uh, we will be, uh, we'll be happy to share that. So with uh, no further ado, um, if uh, Mr. Park would like to uh, share his screen, I will introduce him as a city planner with more than 20 years of experience specializing in innovative solutions that balance community development and design quality concerns. His in integrated approach to comprehensive planning, urban design and development review has created clear visions for sustainable urban development, uh, places of high quality design and streamlined permitting systems. He's overseen numerous planning efforts and implementation of major infrastructure and development projects as planning director uh, of both uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then Denver, Colorado. He currently teaches at the University of Colorado at Denver and was instrumental in shaping its new urban uh, design, master of urban design program. He's previously taught at the University of uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where he coordinated the joint master of architecture and master of urban planning program. He is focused on integrating teaching and practice over his, uh, his career 
and the work in its design studios has influenced real world planning and development outcomes, including the Parkies freeway removal in Milwaukee and the uh, adoption of the Denver zoning code. So uh, I will also note that uh, he uh, brings uh, a Bachelor of Architectural Studies from Arizona State and a Master of Architecture and Master of Urban Planning from the University of, Milwaukee, of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And so Peter, if you would like to uh, start your, um, your slideshow uh, to get the full screen, I will turn it over to you. Sure, yeah. Uh, can you see my full screen? Uh, not quite yet. Not yet, okay. Let's see. How about now? That looks good to me. Okay. Uh, well, hello everyone. And uh, Frank, thank you so much for, uh, and Maya for uh, putting this together. I look forward to a great symposium today. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to your work. I, just as you described it in terms of uh, the range of issues and topics uh, that you have examined. Uh, I think uh, will contribute to really what we all need to understand about highways and cities. Uh, and what I describe as rethinking highways in cities. Uh, and so for me, the starting point is an idea about choice and the importance of thinking about choices. I mean, as Americans, we think of choice. We think that we have a lot of choices and freedom. Uh, and I think as part of the language that we often use uh, in our work, uh, we are planners, we are engineers, we are architects, we're landscape architects, we're academics, and we think about um, making a better future for our communities. And so part of it is thinking about how do we describe improvement, right? The definition of improvement. This is a cartoon that my friend Ian Lockwood put together. Um, describing this idea of improvement or public improvement. And it's important for us to think about, you know, what is an improvement? What defines an improvement? And not only for whom, but, uh, you know, how much improvement is involved. And so for me, I think, I, I think of images like this and I think, well, you know, when the McGrath Highway went in, did the, experience of these folks who sit at their porches in the evening, did it improve? Did their neighborhood improve? Did their quality of life improve? Or these kids uh, before the change to I-70 in Denver, this is the experience of going from their neighborhood uh, to their school. And um, is this an improvement to the health, life, safety issues and concerns of people who live near the freeway, in and around this, uh, this freeway, right? So the question is, you know, we are presented right now at a time where we have choices. We have choices about what kind of future do we want to have for our cities? Uh, is it going to be the future that doubles down on these kind of environments that were created under a particular idea of design and fixing problems in cities? Uh, or are we gonna focus on what kind of places that we would make uh, in the future? So I think right now we sit at a really important opportunity. We have aging infrastructure. That's actually an opportunity. We have continuing trends despite COVID of return to the city. Um, and we have lots of successful examples globally of rethinking highways. Um, you read all the time and for many of you, this is exactly where you live, what you do. Uh, we're fully cognizant of uh, our infrastructure in our, in our country um, and the amount of investment as a fair share of, as a share of our GDP as having uh, uh, steadily decreasing. And our capacity, political capacity as a country to, you know, approach that third rail of increasing gas tax. It's very difficult, right? And so, you know, we have declining revenues. Uh, we have increasing costs in front of us. Not a great situation to be from an economic perspective. And as many of you on this call know, right? Uh, our infrastructure in our country needs some attention. But there's some great research uh, coming out about, you know, 
what future trends are. And the assumptions about what drove the highway system and the building of highways in our cities, uh, connecting our cities across our country um, 60 years ago, well, the world's changed, right? And people have changed. And the way we live has changed. And so there's plenty of things that we need to take into account uh, to understand that accommodating traffic is actually not the purpose of highways, right? Um, we need to think more fully about how the effect of infrastructure investment, not expenditures, but investment in infrastructure can make our cities even better. And we also have a lot of uh, entities like the uh, ITDP, right? Uh, who have chronicled uh, examples of highways, uh, highway removals, highway alternatives in cities from across the globe. And the Congress for the New Urbanism every year uh, has uh, chronicles and keeps track of opportunities for rethinking freeways uh, in American cities. So I would track back to what I think is a pretty simple thing. It's a fundamental design flaw um, of putting highways, limited access highways in cities. Cities fundamentally are about access. Cities and urban places from the very beginning of civilization and the making of cities have been about access and exchange, economic exchange, cultural exchange, social exchange. And the vessel for doing that has been the public realm. Um, and so, you know, if we think about our future, we need to think about how do we design our cities for people first and foremost. So, you know, a limited ask, as access highway moving across the countryside um, makes sense, right? I don't wanna stop at every county line road. I don't wanna stop at every intersection. And in fact, Norman Bel the, let's say the designer of the concept of the American highway system uh, designed it this way. In other words, the future motorway uh, would link between cities, not go through cities, not cut through cities, but really go and connect as a system of interconnected highways between major centers. And then as you approach a city, you would connect into the network, into the rich network. But people like Jane Jacobs, right? Not a planner, not an architect, not an expert. She knew very clearly the importance of frequent streets and short blocks, right? For supporting human activity and human life. Lewis Mumford talked about building highways in cities really as if you were just to bomb a city. And in fact, that is what happened in the ruin of our American cities as these highways were put in. The reality is that the more we limit access, the bigger the blocks get, the wider the streets get, and the lower the performance of the overall network of the system, right? In terms of looking at uh, the overall capacity of the system. And in fact, when Eisenhower signed off on the Highway Act, it wasn't his idea. He did not support the idea of cutting highways through cities, right? He fully understand, understood the importance and supported the idea of connecting city to city. And so there are a lot of, you know, resources that we all have in terms of understanding the importance of and the function of highly connected street networks. And that again is a fundamental of urban places. So in the case of Milwaukee, this is a map of the Park East Freeway before it was removed and replaced with a boulevard. There are basically only three ways on and three ways off, right? It's sort of like, that's the design for creating congestion. Removing the highway, right? And working with the state of Wisconsin and Milwaukee County and the city folks, right? We increased access to downtown by removing the highway. We increased access to downtown by removing a highway. So that the intended direction of uh, uh, a destination of trips, you didn't have to overshoot your destination and backtrack through the city downtown grid, inducing more unnecessary travel, right? Simple design. Again, fundamentally, cities are for people. We ought to be designing cities for the things that humans do, right? In terms of engaging with each other, 
and the economic exchange. If I think about, well, what are all the great places for people? They typically are places where you find a lot of people. If we apply the same concept to say, what are all the great places for cars? Are these the examples of the great places for cars? Well, maybe they are, right? Because look how many there are. But most people experiencing the situation probably don't think it's that great. And so the alteration of our cities, of downtowns, but also neighborhoods, uh, simply ignores the fundamental basic purpose of cities, again, in terms of access and exchange. And in this case, this is downtown Denver in the mid thirties on the left, downtown Denver after it was improved through urban renewal to accommodate thousands of cars at the expense of millions, which today would be billions of dollars in real estate and great historic fabric uh, representing um, the history of the city that was unfortunately lost. And so when I think about how we move vehicles and how we move systems, I think about highways very much sort of similar to the failed experiment of channelizing rivers and streams, right? In nature, when you have a natural channel, you have uh, the meandering of water and it creates adequate uh, um, environment for healthy aquatic life and plant and leaf materials. Um, when man-made channels are made uh, to move water, right? It increases the temperature of the water. It does not provide a habitable place for uh, wildlife and not, I mean, just all kinds of things go wrong in this system, but fundamentally, right? It does channel, it does limit access of where that water goes. But you know, what we've found out is we've proven to ourselves that this is a bad idea. And so now we are spending millions and millions of dollars reopening daylighting streams, channelizing streams, uh, and you know, fixing it so that we can get back to and allow not only nature to be healthy, right? But um, find different and better ways to solve for let's say flooding. So it's about capacity. And so to me, the question is, how do we add choices? How do we focus on placemaking? Some of the work that um, Frank and Maya have looked at, uh, rather than think that we have to solve for congestion. I know that that may seem a little bit odd, but if we focus more on how do we add choices, right? And how do we think about the capacity of a street? Again, a cartoon that my friend Ian drew, if we think about the capacity of the street only for one thing, right? Then that's all you're gonna get. And that's all you're gonna design for. But if you think about the capacity of a street, yeah, for cars, for vehicles, but also for people and bikes and transit and life, right? You would design things quite differently. Right? It wouldn't be an isolated myopic view of designing something, infrastructure solely for movement of vehicles, right? But it would actually be designing communities. And we just think about this in terms of a footprint, in terms of limited land that we have. So if we design for cars, this is how much footprint, right? How much area we need for this many people. That's a lot of land. That's a lot of impervious condition, right? That's a lot of flood inducing, heat, in, heat island inducing kind of conditions. And so what if we thought about this same amount of real estate, this amount of footprint in ways that accommodate more means of traveling around or recognizing the compactness of a streetcar uh, or a busway. And so this is what contributes to uh, how we think about cities as systems, not singularly, but as systems of overlapping integrated networks of movement and land use and places. And fundamentally thinking about people again. So I think about return on investment and the importance of rethinking about not spending our money on infrastructure, but prioritizing our return on investment, especially for local communities. And thinking about how does this expenditure of public money add value and potentially help to capture value? 
And this is this drawing from 1909, right? When Milwaukee was growing, um, I love this drawing because it speaks to an idea about how to design a city, not a road, not a transportation facility, but how to design a city. You see transit in the middle, you see lanes for traffic, you see generous sidewalks for pedestrians, um, and you see this canopy of trees. It's such a beautiful street that one would wanna have their address on that street, right? That we would make infrastructure that the private market would say, that's a choice location. Thinking about how do we use our public money in ways that creates value rather than reduces it. So this was Henry Ford's quote, we'll solve the problem of the city, you know, the overcrowding, the, all the things that were perceived as the bad things of cities by leaving the city, right? Not the most responsible perspective, I would say. Um, and it certainly didn't help Detroit. It didn't help many of our American cities where the policy and the politics at a regional scale actually follow this ridiculous notion. But every single time that we've taken a freeway out of a city, right? City like San Francisco, right? Such a dense place, such a busy place. How could you possibly take a double decker freeway out of the city? And yet when that happened, after it was damaged by an earthquake, the city got better. San Francisco became even more desirable. So I'm sure many on this call are very familiar with transit-oriented development uh, or TOD. And much of the work that I've been involved with uh, has been around transit-oriented development. But I actually don't think about this uh, idea of transit-oriented development as much as I think of it a little bit differently, more development-oriented transportation. That we need to think about how do we invest in our transportation infrastructure in a way that is focused on the development of our cities in terms of the relationship and the integration between land use and making places and the role that transportation plays, right? So the one thing is that it's not one thing. It's not just moving stuff. So I think about it more in terms of POT. Uh, no, no, not like that. Not, you know, I'm from Colorado, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is place-oriented transportation, that we think about what are the kind of places that can be made. This is the Chen River. Uh, on the top right is an image of an elevated freeway that capped the river in Seoul, in downtown Seoul. Um, and this was taken out and made into this unbelievable environment for people, for investment, for commerce, for access. They actually reduced the number of lanes, invested in BRT, took out another freeway in Seoul, Korea, um, and helped to change, change the city away from a, you know, car centric, it, still plenty of cars, no doubt, no doubt about it, right? But the priority of the neighborhoods and the places for people uh, took precedent over accommodation for more traffic. So a couple of thoughts to share. I think as a planner, right? You can never start planning too soon. But the key to it in this case is we need to plan for ways that are based in an urban vision and a community vision. In Milwaukee, we did the downtown plan in 1999. It imagined a whole bunch of things, right? A new public market downtown, Riverwalk, new housing downtown, converting one-way streets back to two-way, whole number of things, even contemplated taking out the parking streetway, right? We didn't have an idea of when that would happen. Like all of these things have happened actually, unbelievably. It was a 20 year plan. Most of the big things happened in less than 10 years actually. But taking out the freeway, replacing it with a boulevard was something that we wanted to put in the downtown plan. So when the time came to consider, well, what could happen? What should happen to this freeway? The city of Milwaukee was in place, had an idea about what to do about it. And so here's the former elevated Park East Freeway. You can see all the great land value that was created when it went in. For 30 years, it stood in a way that only the highest and best use was, you know, I don't know, cheap surface parking uh, dripping into the Milwaukee River. So the plan contemplated development, mix of uses, right? Replacing it with a street network. And because we had that plan, 
when the opportunity came and Harley Davidson was looking for a location for the Harley experience, right? We were able to move forward, right? We, we had, we didn't know this was going to happen, but we, in that case, just had an opportunity of an interested party that would actually be significantly helpful in moving the conversation forward and convincing the governor and the state and the county that the Parkies Freeway could come out. And that's what happened. Ultimately, Harley Davidson didn't go to that site, but we'd already started with the demolition. So it's okay. The important thing is, right, we planned it and we were ready with the, with the vision. And when the opportunity came, we could execute. Another important thing, code it. Have clear and predictable regulations. We did a form-based code in Milwaukee, one of the earliest form-based codes. Uh, simple regulations to guide development. And there's been billion, you know, like over a billion dollars of new downtown investment that has happened here, right? Um, that is added to the excitement, that is added to uh, the opportunity of making, remaking a downtown uh, uh, around people and around attracting investment, jobs, housing, entertainment, a whole range of things because the freeway came out, the land became available, right? Own it. So in the process, what I think is, is a very important lesson that we learned is that we look, need to figure out a way to prioritize the swift land transfer and local control of the land. When um, this uh, 28 acres or so of land uh, inc included quite a lot of public right of way, right? On the other side. And so the transfer of the land went to Milwaukee County, a little bit went to the city. Our priority was putting back the streets and blocks, right? And the state of Wisconsin and the Fed uh, agreed uh, to that swift transfer uh, and didn't require uh, uh, repayment, which I think is a maybe a topic that Frank addresses. And, and I think it's reasonable. I mean, when in the case of the Park East, for example, uh, there were a lot of columns that were still remaining and the foundations for those columns were not removed as part of the demolition. It would have been even more costly. But I think in future lesson learned, I think it would be even more ideal to uh, have a lot of those infrastructures removed if, um, if, if, if a freeway is removed. And finally, a couple of thoughts. Leadership, right? All politics is local. Uh, making these things, these things happen certainly can be helped by federal and state initiatives. But fundamentally, it's all about local leadership and the question of what does the community want? Uh, this is Mayor John Norquist, who um, was my boss uh, as he and I were touring uh, the demolition of the Park East. Um, so just in conclusion, you know, we can make smart cars, but we shouldn't be making dumb places, right? We've got plenty of examples of those. This is the time for us to fix these things. And land, well, they're not making it anymore, right? Uh, but we actually have quite a lot of land available, underutilized real estate inner cities made by these freeway cuts that were made through them. And density, you know, we're not afraid about it, right? What we've learned in the evolution of cities, especially the American city, is separating ourselves further and further out has not contributed to the economic strength, the, the social and political strength of our cities and cultural strength of our cities. Uh, and we have a return in the city that gives us a significant opportunity. But I would say this, I would say, I always try to avoid defining a problem with solutions, right? So sometimes a cap might be a good idea, a partial cap, a tunnel, right? A removal or filling in like in Rochester. There's a whole range of things. The important thing is first figure out well, what are we trying to solve for? And if we can at least elevate the conversation well beyond we're solving for congestion, I think we're making huge advances, right? So a few last lessons. What I found in my experience Success requires strong community support with extraordinary, extraordinary leadership and political will. You need to have an urban vision for the city, not dominated by the automobile, but one that prioritizes the short trip versus the long trip. A decision process driven by long-term community investment versus spending federal allocations on projects within a given time frame. right? I mean, we understand the pressure of that. 
and a focus on return on investment for the local community and a focus on local land control. And then finally, just recognizing that it's not technical, it's political. This has been done. A whole range of options, alternatives have been executed on cities that have improved, right? And I just leave you with this idea that I don't have, I have not found a single neighborhood that got better when a freeway was built over it or cut through it. But every single time, every single time, a freeway has been taken out or some kind of mediation that privileges people first, every time that happens, the neighborhood gets better. Thanks. I look forward to our conversations. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Peter. Um, that I think you teed up a lot of really, uh, really interesting um, uh, uh, topics and, and, and so forth. We have uh, uh, one question that came in that I will hold until after we've heard from the cases. Um, but uh, then uh, 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 we'll, we'll move on to that. Uh, and and uh, you, you've teed up uh, a lot of really interesting insights from Milwaukee, and I know the rest of the delegation from Wisconsin is uh, ready to, uh, to to jump in. But I'm going to pull a fast one here if uh, Liano from Atlanta is uh, is ready to go, because I would like to uh, make sure we've got a, a broad set of uh, presentations and perspectives here. And uh, here's somebody who, when it comes to working with the community. Uh, is uh, right there uh, as the executive director of Sweet Auburn, Auburn Works, a preservation-based economic development organization created to protect and enhance the commercial and cultural legacy of the Sweet Auburn Historic District in Atlanta. He brings more than 18 years of private sector operating and finance expertise uh, from Africa and Asia to the U.S. for this role, and he's employed these skills as uh, to create a career using private capital to solve difficult market problems. This is an important note. This is not just a government issue here. Uh, he brings a very uh, uh, important set of perspectives and experiences uh, with his uh, BA in economics from Morehouse College and an MS in finance from the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. And uh, uh, when he's not uh, promoting and making Atlanta a better place to live, he's an avid outdoorsman uh, and when not hiking or biking, enjoys cooking with his friends and family. So uh, I will turn it over to uh, uh, Liano and, uh, and Maya to make sure that the slides get, uh, get up. And uh, the next uh, 10 minutes or so, Liano, are all yours. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And Frank, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, it's <laughs> the background is anecdotal to the job. Uh, the job is out of passion. Um, for an historic African-American uh, neighborhood uh, just east of downtown Atlanta called Sweet Auburn. Can you guys see the uh, title page of the slides? It looks great. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, wow, Peter, great, great framing of some really complex issues um, that affect so many communities. Um, let's just say transportation affects every community. Um, 100%. And then uh, those decisions that you talked about where folks normally would be thinking about how cities should be for people um, and how logic would have created uh, different outcomes, you know, from the 1950s forward. Um, <laughs> you know, that logic isn't always available when you want it. So when you, when, if you lack leadership, if you lack political will, if you lack um, a responsibility to a community, uh, with your transportation infrastructure, you have challenges. Um, I'm going to present to you our organization and one of the challenges um, that we had as a community, um, as a 170 year old African-American community in downtown Atlanta, um, um, and one attempt to mitigate against that challenge uh, was something we call the Auburn, Ab Auburn Avenue History and Culture Project. Um, for those who know Richard Moe at the National Trust, um, this quote gives you a really good spirit, I think, of the work we do. Um, I won't read it out loud. It's been up for a while. But just know, um, this, is what, this is how we think about the work that we do on a daily basis. So let's, let's see if I can get my own slide. Open. There we go. Um, 
So this is what Sweet Auburn looks like. This is an historic building uh, built in 1913 called the Oddfellows Building. It was uh, designed, constructed, financed, and owned by African Americans uh, uh, in 1913. And I think it represents uh, the work that we do. As you see, SAW is a preservation-based economic development organization. Uh, we are the only Main Street organization in the city of Atlanta. Um, we are not municipally sponsored. We are a private 501c3 that uh, believes in using this rubric to do this work. Uh, so what do I do every day? Good Lord. Uh, put in parklets, give a lot of tours, um, manage uh, outdoor commercial markets. We have to put in our own bike lanes, and that sounds silly, um, but we have to think about um, alternative modes of transportation. We're very, uh, it, being the age that we are in a neighborhood, we are, um, uh, we have a beautiful architectural rhythm, narrow streets, and it lends itself to um, all sorts of alternative uh, transportation, not just uh, vehicular uh, via cars. Um, so that history I mentioned to you, just a few of the old images. I hate going old, but it's, sometimes it's nice to get context. On your top left, you see uh, the Atlanta Daily World was, interestingly enough, the first successful Black daily newspaper in the country. Um, WERD radio station at the bottom was the first African-American owned radio station in North America. Uh, we also happened to be the neighborhood that was the birthplace of a Dr. King and where all of his um, employers were. This is an image of him that um, in front of a, an historic Masonic Lodge, a Prince Hall Masonic Lodge on Auburn Avenue and his, his, his only office at uh, the SCLC Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And that uh, beautiful building in the middle with the Beaux-Arts facade is um, the Atlanta Life Insurance Building, once the second largest African-American um, insurance institution in the country. It is uh, um, that building you see in 1927 on top when the facade was put on. Um, so that's kind of the legacy that we protect, among other things. I didn't mention everything, but we've got, we were the first African-American bottling company uh, in this neighborhood as well in the country. So. Um, from a neighborhood perspective, uh, a lot of my Main Street's um, resin detriment is to sort of coalesce our land owning stakeholders, make sure we're all on the same page and think about what the vision of this community should look like. So we all desperately believe in the adaptive reuse of our historic building inventory. We are on, um, some may know the National Historic um, Landmark Registry. Um, also, we have municipal protections, um, but just in general, we believe that um, the growth of our neighborhood um, is, is going to be um, in promoting our, our cultural heritage and our past, either in our intangible assets or our physical ones. And as you can see, the second bullet around cultural heritage preservation, that's us. Um, and then we think about our, the holistic growth of the neighborhood, that's green, equitable, um, and that is in transportation as well, and supports the quality of life for those who live here, who visit and who own. Uh, so here is the deal. Everybody's got one. This is ours. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a late 50s uh, transportation project to move um, uh, I-75-85 through downtown Atlanta. You'll see that there's a bow in this highway. It was bowed around the Central Business District into this historic African-American neighborhood. Uh, destroying a good number of hectares of land, as you can tell, um, and breaking up, um, again, a 170-year-old historic neighborhood. Um, we don't have to get that much into that, uh, but I've already told you the provenance of what, what the neighborhood had previously been and that it has national protections. Um, and so now, with this thing here, how does a Main Street program help its landowning stakeholders think about moving forward and, um, you know, quote unquote, mitigating it's the negative effects of it? Um, on the ground, we have things like this, right? These uh, tunnel that uh, is massive and holds 10 lanes of travel, uh, traffic travel, um, and separates, um, <laughs> separates daylight uh, on two sides of a commercial quarter with um, whatever you want to describe this as. Um, and I'm, I'm showing you guys this as a, as a treatment in 2008. 
is when the tunnel looked like this. Uh, we had a fix, and the fix was to, um, alongside GDOT, Georgia Department of Transportation, invest $1.2 million in um, an historical marker, um, wayfinding, and, um, and mural project to take a half mile walk from um, the Central Business District out to the, um, our permanent National Historical, uh, Historical Park the MLK Junior Historical Park. We have our own little, you know, Yosemite or, or Yellowstone, uh, but it's an urban park and it's uh, designed to curate the life um, of Dr. King. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is one of the, one of the issues. It's, uh, I'm sorry, one of the implementations. There are 23 distinct information nodes. You see that one's numbered seven. Um, they sit at points of agglomeration. We're lucky enough to have a, a streetcar in the neighborhood. It's, um, you know, lucky, unlucky. Uh, the implementation of the streetcar probably wasn't uh, exceptional, but at least we have alternative uh, modes of travel. Um, here's one in front of our famous John Lewis mural. That uh, five-story mural uh, represents um, an homage to uh, the uh, Representative Lewis, and you'll see the wayfinding bit on, on this marker. And then we had some uh, cultural heritage images uh, here sitting in a park that's along that half mile walk that I mentioned. Um, when you think about execution, you guys notice that <laughs> there's information at the very top of that that you can't even see. You'd have to have binoculars to, 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 to actually get a chance to access what it is they're trying to explain or show you. But some would say it's better than nothing. Um, and the centerpiece of the historical marker um, project is this mural that visually represents uh, the history of the of the um, of the neighborhood. Uh, this is the published picture <laughs> with a, probably a, a higher ISO on the on the lens. Um, the idea was to brighten up the tunnel a bit and give uh, pedestrians something to look at. Um, this is actually what your experience is when you go in there. Um, and so we have contemplated what it is we can do with this large infrastructure in the neighborhood, um, with this mild attempt at mitigating against the negative effects of it. But you can see it's, um, you know, you hate to use terrible language, but it's like a Band-Aid on a broken leg. Um, you see the, the, the height and the expanse of the existing infrastructure. I'll give you another um, picture of it deeper into the tunnel. Um, now, if we back up a bit, you can see just the scale of this thing ripping through in a historic neighborhood. Um, if you keep looking, I want you to notice um, the empty development on the either on either side of this. Now, you are literally again 0.4 miles from downtown Atlanta. Um, with property values approaching $20 million an acre. But because of the implementation of this, you know, everything within a few blocks of this is, is left fallow. Um, this is now on the other side of it, um, an underutilized or unutilized parking lot, surface lot. Um, and you still see the scale and size the wonderful directionals to get on that piece of infrastructure, 7585, as I mentioned before, and again, more scale. Um, you can only imagine uh, the amount of, I think, Peter, you referred, the amount of uh, existing new um, acreage that the community could, could, um, could reclaim, if only in park space or even commercial space. Um, uh, with this, with this not this infrastructure not in the way, um, still again, just the scale of it is uh, is massive. And again, see the empty lots um, ripe for development, um, if only someone would take the chance. And wait, hold on. Before we get to the end, I, I so that was to give you an impression. Um, for those who are aware of of uh, the Reconnecting Communities Act. And, um, and the grant program that's come out of it. Uh, 
uh, we're the type of neighborhood that, and I think to Peter's point earlier, again, we're not interested necessarily in coming up with solutions to define a problem, but um, we're using this opportunity to help better frame the problem, help better frame um, the necessity to mitigate against this. You know, we're, we're, look, there's a billboard in the back um, in an historic district, that shouldn't be the case. We've got heightened temperatures, you know, of two to three degrees uh, because of this quarter coming through, uh, obviously heightened CO2 emissions. And again, the loss of, of historic fabric and neighborhood fabric and uh, addressable real estate as a result of the infrastructure here. So, you know, the hope is to find um, from a planning perspective, best and brightest thinkers to help us figure out a way to help GDOT and the neighborhood and the city reimagine um, what this infrastructure could look like. Um, and I'll use the language again, mitigate it against in its best way possible. Um, now, Frank, I wanted this to be more uh, conversational. You know, I could talk about this for days and, I'm, and my job isn't necessarily to beat up on this thing in my neighborhood, but um, uh, I did want to show opportunity with challenge and give the perspective uh, from our neighborhood landowning stakeholders. Um, but if you'd like, we can uh, hold off on questions for later. Would that be helpful? Um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, uh, Liano, if you don't mind, uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to the Wisconsin folks and then we'll take uh, time for some Q&A right after that. Is that uh, no work all. for you? 100%. Great, thanks so much. No problem. So Liano, really uh, do appreciate your, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're giving the, the perspective there. Um, on, the, on the one hand, uh, the uh, effort and which picked up our attention of uh, uh, a number of stakeholders coming together, um, largely uh, without um, the big infrastructure agencies getting involved until uh, the vision came, uh, came about. Um, in Atlanta, uh, that's that was uh, quite interesting. But uh, we also appreciate you giving the overall perspective about how much more opportunity there is. Uh, we'll now go back to Wisconsin. Uh, we have four speakers uh, to talk about uh, more of what's been going on uh, in, uh, in in and around the uh, the freeways in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, we'll, uh, we have David Wynn, who uh, works for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation as a project development chief. Uh, he graduated uh, from Marquette University with BS in civil and environmental engineering in 1992 and 30, has 30 years of experience in highway transportation projects. We also have Adrian Lopez, uh, another 30 year veteran uh, with the Wisconsin DOT uh, and uh, has been involved in planning, design, construction and maintenance of local roads, state highways and freeway facilities ranging from Park East to other mega projects in Milwaukee, Racine and Kenosha counties. He's been involved with community sensitive design and identifying and mitigating transportation impacts uh, to communities throughout his career. Uh, we also have Chris French who came to the Wisconsin DOT real estate department in the Southeast region that's uh, in Waukesha uh, with a strong engineering background with an education from the University of Minnesota. So uh, for those who think Wisconsin and Minnesota are, are just mortal enemies, we're here to show just how much we can learn from each other. And Chris is an example of that. Uh, he has experiential background in business, business brokering to small and mid-market companies in the Milwaukee area. Uh, and has been working in the region's property management group since uh, 2018. And then finally, Bao Tran, who is the technical services uh, chief overseeing materials, real estate, survey and uh, utility unit in section one of the Wisconsin DOT. He has 28 years of design construction and system operations experience. He's worked 10 years as a consultant working on Wisconsin DOT projects and 18 years with the Wisconsin DOT uh, as construction design lead, project manager and supervisor on numerous and diverse projects. Um, so uh, math was not required for today, but I think we've got over 100 years of uh, experience now represented to talk here about Milwaukee. So I will stop and uh, give the next several minutes uh, to this group to talk in more detail about uh, uh, the Park East as well as uh, some current innovations that are going on in the area. All right, good afternoon. I'm David Wynn. 
with Department of Transportation. Can you hear me okay? All right, excellent. Uh, before I dive into the parkies uh, design and, and construction of that project, um, I wanted to um, kind of give a, a quick over, overview of what we're going to be covering this afternoon. Um, Adrian and I are going to cover the design and reconstruction of the Park East project. Bao Tran and Chris French is going to share um, their experience on what, what we're using the land for underneath 794. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview uh, about where we are as far in relation to uh, to the city of Milwaukee and the two projects. With that, I'll dive right into the Park East reconfiguration project. Well, just like what Peter Park was saying before, um, every plan, um, you're gonna need some funding to carry out. So um, the Park East removal and reconstruction of the, the grid system began with the uh, the ice t act or the um, the intermodal surface transportation efficiency act that was signed by president george h w bush back in 1991 uh, the state of wisconsin received um, about 241 million dollars that, that was to be split between the state and the local units of government um, so the money um, got, got um, awarded to to the state and this, the county and the city in 91. However, that money was just sitting there for a good five or six years. The um, Finally, the city, county, and state got together and figured out what they were going to do with that money. So in December of 1997 or so, roughly six years later, a cooperative agreement was signed and um, the community leaders, the governor, uh, the county executive, um, Mayor John Norquist, which Peter Park mentioned um, a little bit earlier, agreed it to spend um, that $241 million on three major projects along with um, a handful of other uh, surface transportation projects. Uh, just, just in case you are familiar with the area, um, the funding went to $75 million, went to the, the Marquette Interchange Reconstruction. You may have heard about that project just to get that project started. Uh, 60 million, was to be dedicated to reconstruction of the Sixth Street Viaduct. Uh, $25 million was going to be um, used for the Park East removal and reconstruction of the grid system underneath. And then uh, the balance of $81 million was going to go to other local projects. So um, on the screen here, we, we're going to, I'm going to dive into more of the how the, uh, um, what was the mindset for the folks with the, you know, with the DOT at the time? I, I've got to admit, I'm, I'm not an urban planner. Um, I'm, I'm a highway guy. I'm a very much pro highway uh, guy. So, um, so when we first got into the project, there was a reluctance within internally. Um, so, however, we were able to overcome that as we um, dive into the environmental process, uh, going through the NEPA process. So, um, the Park East Freeway was essentially um, on the near north side of downtown Milwaukee. Um, as you may have heard before from Peter, it was uh, uh, underutilized of land available. Um, we wanted to provide better connection uh, which to the local street system, which Peter Park uh, mentioned. 
uh, providing more green space. And certainly I'm not going to be able to do it justice like Peter did uh, earlier. So um, the project limits uh, roughly from A Street uh, from the west to uh, Jefferson Street to the east is roughly about 10 city blocks, of which eight blocks are um, elevated. Um, the agreement was to have the three agencies work together. Uh, Milwaukee County agreed it to take the lead on the environmental study. State DOT, we agreed it to um, lead the final design and administer the construction contracts. The city um, agreed it to work with uh, utility re uh, coordination. They, they agreed that, that they would cover uh, additional costs beyond the $25 million. Um, before Adrian and I dive into the actual uh, reconstruction of the project, I, I wanted to give you a quick timeline of, um, of, of the environmental study. So we began the environmental study in 1999. Uh, we got that done just right before Christmas of 2001. Um, in December of 2001, that's when the EA FONSI or the environmental assessment slash uh, finding of no significant impact document was approved by uh, federal highways. Um, we began design and uh, final design in 2003 two in 2000 uh, and finish up with the plants in 2003. Um, in 2002 or so, we put out a, uh, a, a prep contract, basically to start out with the uh, temporary ram reconstruction and then follow up with the demolition um, slash roadway contract and then eventually build a liberate project so that all took place between late uh, the mid of 2002 to uh, uh, the summer of 2005. The cost um, was, uh, the total cost was ended up to be roughly about $30 million. And um, I, I'm not sure if Peter touched on this, but when we got done with the project, um, it yielded roughly about 13, uh, 15 acres for uh, development. So what had happened was that with, with the park east to the north of downtown Milwaukee, uh, with that taken down, it allowed it, the city to grow north, uh, provided additional tax base to the city of Milwaukee. Um, you may, I think you saw the picture of the new uh, uh, Pfizer Forum, uh, which uh, the Park East project facilitated the and the construction of that building. Not to mention, I, I didn't want to forget this, a Pfizer Forum, of course, the home of the 2021 NBA champion Milwaukee Bucks. I just wanted to make sure I get that in there. Um, and as you may have seen the, on, on some of the photos that Peter shared that, um, you know, it's, it's part of the growing deer district that you may have seen during uh, the Bucks run of the uh, NBA finals in uh, 2021. Um, so with the available land, um, the Bucks was able to put their practice facility on there. Um, there, there are plans for hotels, apartments, restaurants, and other developments uh, popping up. Um, I know it's been a while. Um, on the east end of the Park East project, it also allowed the uh, Milwaukee School of Engineering to expand. So with that, I'm going to go into the, uh, the construction of the contracts. I mean, uh, not the, yeah. The construction contract. So, as I mentioned earlier, we began with uh, a, a prep contract to put in a, a temporary ramp, which would then that would facilitate uh, us being able to provide um, 
westbound eastbound traffic on, on the existing eastbound structure, which is in green and, and light blue there. And then um, we can then demolish the westbound structure, which is in red. So, I mean, if you were to look up the Google map now, uh, essentially what you see in blue here is the, re, uh, the, the grid system, the grid street system that got uh, reestablished. So um, after we put McKinley Boulevard, and oh, by the way, I mean, if you look up the Google map, west of the Milwaukee River, uh, the street name is McKinley Avenue. But then if you cross the bridge, the lip bridge, which you see in green, to the east is um, it's called Knapp Street. So, so pay attention to that if you're actually going to be looking that up on Google Map. Um, so, so in order for traffic to to go from the east to the west, or west back to the east, we have to put in that uh, vertical lip bridge. So here's the Here's the rendering of the, the live bridge that, that got built. Um, I'm sure there's plenty more uh, pictures that you could uh, look up on Google Map. So with that, I'll turn it over to Adrian Lopez to cover more of uh, the construction of the Park East and McKinley Avenue. I think you Go covered ahead, it. <laughs> I, I really not have nothing to add, uh, David. I think you covered most of my slides. Um, that I was going to get into. I think just a couple of things I want to emphasize. What David, you know, you know, he talked about 1997. Uh, planning started. We started construction around 2000, so that's a good five years of planning. It still took another two, two and a half years for construction and stuff like that. So you're you're talking about a 10 year span here, and a lot of these uh, ideas and and projects they do take about 10 years to kind of from planning stage all the way to, in, um, to the, the, see the final in, uh, vision of that planning there. So, so I think that was a unique thing about the Park East, at least from my perspective for construction, is that you know, I saw the, the back end of it. David had done uh, most of the hard work in, in the planning and design stage. And I actually had the privilege of uh, actually building it and being involved with that process. So that was, yeah, that was especially, uh, that was an excellent opportunity on my end. And, and I kind of saw kind of like Peter Park uh, was talking about uh, access, you know, even during construction with uh, adding that uh, ramp so we can maintain traffic uh, during construction and, and uh, pedestrian traffic through construction and, and the final vision and, and then restricting tra uh, traffic for safety reasons. And that, so I just want to emphasize that that idea of access, getting in and out and the appropriate access and the appropriate restriction of access in your discussion today. And then as far as cost, uh, like David said, about $30 million. Um, I think let dollars at the time, I think it was around uh, $15 million or so for the actual let dollars. So that's $2,002. So, uh, you know, from a community perspective, relatively small dollars. And I think it's a lot of fruit came out of that from development and, and opening up uh, opportunities for, for the communities and such like that. So with that, uh, if, if we have some time, do we have some construction? Yeah, pictures? before I turn it over to Chris and Bob, um, I, I kind of want to wrap it up real quick, Adrian. Yep. I'm, I'm wrapping so, it up right now, so. No, yeah, no, I, I, I was going to do a quick wrap up here as far as what I saw. I, I am going to jump um, in just to give a little time notice as well, so if uh, we can. Perfect. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. So, so in conclusion, um, you're going to need funding to do do the project. You you've heard from Peter Park before that you're going to need cooperation from all levels, federal, state, county, and city. Um, the when projects take take a long time because most often times you have uh, changes in leadership, so that's going to slow down the project. Um, it takes time to do a project like that. Um, pro highway agencies, uh, in our case, um, we, we need to have an open mind. Uh, highly recommend that you follow the NEPA process. 
of course, you know, you know, you got to address the traffic concerns. Uh, look for long-term benefits, um, especially, you know, you, you're not going to have to deal with the maintenance and reconstruction costs of, of the new infrastructure. Um, and uh, like what Peter has alluded to before, that you need leadership from the local unit of government to keep advocating and keep pushing for the project. And uh, don't give up. All right, with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris and, uh, and, and Bao. Thank you. Uh, I think, Bao, you're running the slides there. I appreciate yes. it. Um, <clears throat> The first thing I wanted to point out is uh, we're switching gears a little bit. I, I'm not into planning, um, don't even really do engineering, but I'm really responsible for leasing properties in the um, southeast region of the state. And the majority of those are properties that are under the I-794 um, uh, freeway. The It is extremely uh, much a cooperative agreement between not only the county and the city, but FHWA and us, because uh, federal money being put into all of those uh, freeways, the rights of way that we utilize um, for leasing purposes are all in airspace. So for those that may not know what that is, that's generally from the the space from the bottom of the deck to the uh, from the bridge deck to the um, ground below. Um, many cases, the county of Milwaukee uh, still holds title to that land, although they're willing to turn it over to us if we want. Um, the issue becomes: okay, who's going to enforce law? Who's going to do maintenance of those leased areas? Things of that nature. Um, so actually, it, the way above is um, maintained by a combination of the city and the county. County law enforcement, sheriff's department um, is really the guys that are called in times of trouble on top of the freeway. Underneath, it's more or less the um, city uh, maintaining things. And <clears throat> also our BOWS former department, the uh, freeway maintenance group, um, they have certain people assigned to uh, areas down there to keep an eye on on them. Um, so it all gets taken care of. Um, if you want to go to the next one, Bob, that'd be great. Um, this is the area we're talking about. And of note is at the very top of the photograph, uh, Milwaukee downtown uh, bid 21 is the uh, business improvement district that um, really takes care of a lot of this area. And then down below is the uh, mention of the historic third ward, which is, um, I won't call it run, but it's handled by the business improvement district number two. And one of the reasons for all of the uh, leases and property uses underneath here is to really get connection between these two areas because the um, uh, Milwaukee downtown is truly mostly commercial businesses. There's not a lot of residential um, down there where in the, the historic third ward that has been resurging for quite a while. And there's a number of um, not only apartment complex, but a lot of condos being built. If you, go straight to the right here. You can't see it on the slide, but you're in Lake Michigan. So there's a number of um, condo developments uh, going in uh, at the lakefront gateway there. And that truly is the gateway from the, the lakefront. Um, there's a, you can see a piece of what, in this picture is a blank piece of property right just north of Clybourne. That, um, that piece of property even north of that, um, that piece of property is a, a major development going on that's um, multi-use, the uh, uh, residential. Uh, there'll be, there's some talk about transportation getting into there. 
the, the local streetcar. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Um, but some of the other uses that we have down here are more or less to connect those two areas, the, the downtown and the historic third ward, since it was kind of divided by the interstate, um, probably too much to the um, chagrin of, of Peter Park. <laughs> um, but all those north-south streets are uh, traversable either by car and or bicycle, motorcycle, and pedestrians. And so they've tried to do a number of things to improve those areas. Of real note um, are the two that are, you'll see the red dotted areas. One's called the Dog Run. It's going to be called the Milwaukee Downtown Dog Run, I believe. And then next to that, you'll see an improved parking lot. This is kind of a unique situation in that um, we'll, we'll have a slide later on where I'll show you what the Dog Run's going to look like. Currently, the documents for that are into the FHWA um, for uh, approval. We had to collaborate between attorneys of the um, uh, WSDOT, uh, Office of General Counsel, and the city and the county. Um, and then we turn it over to FHWA to say, okay, what do we do? What else do we need to do? But so we've, this has been probably five years in the making with the interruption of COVID, um, it, it created havoc with scheduling, but um, both areas are related in that the parking lot will be um, a right-of-way lease agreement or an airspace lease agreement where there will be income derived from that. Um, that income will be used to pay for the construction and the maintenance of the dog run area. The dog run area is going to be, it's titled as a right of way use agreement. So we've de delineated the two um, by saying one is bringing in income to the project, the other is not. Uh, but the other has a lot of other benefits. Um, there is nothing like it in the area there's only, from my understanding, four to six um, metropolitan dog runs in the country like this. Um, and I'm getting that information from the two directors of the um, business improvement districts who are the ones that really push this project towards us and say, can we do this? Will you allow us to do it? Um, what do you need from us to get it done? So on and so forth. And they actually toured, uh, I think, three other uh, metropolitan dog parks to see, you know, what they could uh, do. Uh, we have some other things down here listed on here. The Hot Street car is listed on here, um, and that they have a maintenance facility. Um, you'll see over to the far left of this picture. That's underneath the um, the interstate. Um, then. Going a little bit further to the left there, you'll see on the south of the interstate is the MMSD green infrastructure area. That was a collaborative agreement with the, the city and the um, Metropolitan Sewerage District to try to get some of the the water that we get with uh, rainfall and melting snow um, off of the interstate. And rather than pumping it straight into the uh, Lake Michigan to get it treated um, as soon as it lands on the ground, it, it gets pumped into um, treatment station. And it, the whole idea is to minimize the overflow that goes into the Milwaukee sewer system. Um, unfortunately, the stormwater sewers and the, um, the uh, sanitary sewers do get blended. Um, and this, this is something that the sewerage district really wanted to do as well. Um, there is hey Chris, the potential. Uh, if I can uh, a... just jump in and 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 uh, uh, see if uh, we we can uh, wrap wrap in a couple of minutes here. Okay, I can try. Sorry about up. that. That's all right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have two types of agreements that we typically use: the right of way use agreement. Um, this is the dog run. The upper picture is as we look at it right now. Um, it's just a blank lot. There's the Milwaukee River is in the background. And then below is the rendering 
um, for what the dog run's going to be like. And you'll notice a little bit of um, mural painting on the columns. That's something that's done quite often in Milwaukee um, with our our oversight. Um, it does provide better connection to the local street system. Um, obviously, it provides more green space. Right there, it's on the bottom. It's green. Um, uh, it's it is consistent with downtown Milwaukee master plan because it's coming out of the um, business improvement districts and it certainly improves the connectivity between the downtown and the historic third ward. Then the other agreement we have is the airspace leases. And I just have one example here. This is uh, looking West on the left side uh, are actually two lots that are um, used exclusively by Johnson controls. So, we in the city uh, have a, or we in the county, I should say, have a lease with uh, Johnson Controls uh, that we derive monthly income from. Um, so it was underutilized land. Um, a lot of the space underneath is used for parking. Um, it again, provides a better connection between the streets. Um, it does provide county and, and um, WISDOT with income to continue more um, generally road work, freeway work, whatever. Uh, it's incoming income. So I, I tend to personally brag to a lot of the people at our office that I'm one of the few guys that brings money into the DOT instead of spending it. <laughs> um, and again, it is also consistent with the downtown master plan. And I think that is all I have at this point. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh... Afternoon, everyone. Bao Trey on here. I just want to wrap things up real quick. Um, as David alluded to, we are transportation folks and we're pro freeways. Um, all these initiatives have started about last 10 years where uh, we see that there's benefit and value to having these areas being uh, activated. Um, in the past, we would kind of neglect these areas because we would concentrate on the roadway itself. and Everything below it is something that we don't pay attention to as much. But now we've been approached more and asking what can we do to help make these areas a livelier, kind of what the slide shows, underutilized land, better connection, and connect the community. So we are more aware of that and uh, doing more and more of these type of uh, projects. So just want to share that. Y'all have, Frank. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Really appreciate all of you uh, taking the time and, and uh, providing all of this information. Um, I'm going to uh, exercise some some moderator privilege here, uh, just as uh, we're um, we are uh, taking a little more time to provide lots of great information than uh, than anticipated. Um, for those of you who do have questions, uh, I know a number of you have spotted the uh, question and answer button. Uh, we are able to uh, have any of the panelists uh, respond to your questions uh, through typed answers. Um, uh, and so please uh, continue to contribute those. Those questions that we don't get a uh, chance to answer in typing, we will uh, have some time after we, uh, we finish with the speakers. But I know uh, uh, Scott Kratz, our next speaker from the Washington uh, DC 11th Street Bridge project does have uh, some limited time. And so I'd like to go straight to him. Uh, he's been working for the last 10 years with the Ward 8 nonprofit building bridges across the river, as well as district agencies to transform an old freeway bridge into a park above, above the Anacostia River. And I'll let him talk a little more detail about what all that uh, means. But uh, he has been in and lived in the Washington, D.C. area for the last 16 years. And uh, he began his uh, career teaching at Kids Space, a children's museum in Pasadena, California, and later as the associate director of the Institute for the Study of the American West in Los Angeles, uh, which is part of the Autry National Center. Um, and most recently, he has uh, been vice president for education at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. So you uh, can be a highway person, or you can be somebody who wonders exactly maybe what he's doing in transportation. Uh, Scott, I hope I didn't mischaracterize you too much, but uh, I, we look forward to hearing uh, your discussion of the 11th Street Bridge project. Thank you, Frank, and thanks, Maya, and thanks to the rest of the team for the invitation. 
Um, so it is great to be with you all today. Um, uh, mentioned, I'm, my name is Scott Kratz. I'm the director of the 11th Street Bridge Park, and we're building a new civic space on top of the, um, the Anacostia River that whose goal that I think is many of our the speakers goal today, which is stitching together two long divided neighborhoods, in our case, stitching together the nation's capital. Um, and our goal is to support the community's environmental, cultural, economic, and, and physical health. Um, we are facing a formidable challenge, um, like many cities across the United States. The city has been divided by not one, but two freeways, uh, a river, which also means that we've been divided for generations by class, by income, by race, and economic opportunity. And our goal with the 11th Street Bridge Park is to physically and metaphorically um, reconnect and, and bridge these communities. So, um, and what's at stake here, I think, is the future of our city, um, who desperately needs a solution to keep our fabric together and strong. Um, and so what we're doing, and we'll, I'll share in a few slides in just a minute, um, the, uh, is our work that primarily falls into three different buckets. First is working with local residents to create this new civic space, the 11th Street Bridge Park. Second is to invest in the nearby neighborhoods to ensure that long-term residents can stay and thrive in place. And third, uh, to build an inclusive economic model that can be replicated across the city and, and across the country. Um, and that's the key part of that is sort of what I call our, our secret sauce. It's to invest in these underinvested neighborhoods without displacing the same residents we're trying to serve. Um, and we call that our equitable development plan that I'll talk more about in just a minute. But with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and hopefully you can all see that. Um, let me get it. There we go. That good? Um, so first, just to mention, um, I work for, this is a public-private partnership working with the District Department of Transportation. I work for a nonprofit um, based east of the Anacostia River um, here in DC called Building Bridges Across the River. We run a 203,000 square foot campus called The Arc that houses 14 different nonprofits, all co-located on one campus. Um, we run a network of seven urban farms, a workforce development center, but our largest project to date has been the 11th Street Bridge Park. And here you can see the Anacostia River here in Washington, DC, the Potomac River, the better known river is located off to your lower left-hand side. Um, and you can see that this river um, has divided these communities west and east of the river um, for ever. Um, the, and in our case, um, it's not just the river, we have the 295 freeway north of the uh, 295 freeway south of the river and the 695 freeway north of the river We've done a pretty amazing job of building as many barriers as we can between humans and each other and humans in the natural environment. And in our case, we had this old freeway bridge that was built in the 1960s that came to the end of its lifespan and needed to be replaced. This has been a crossing for over 300 years. Um, the, um, and we there was a thought um, the, when these bridges needed to be replaced, instead of getting rid of the old infrastructure, can we explore salvaging, uh, retaining part of that old infrastructure, in our case, the piers and the pilings underneath, um, and repurpose them to create uh, a new bridge um, the, that no longer has to hold cars or tractor trailers, but that can hold community-generated programming spaces. So the deck has been removed. We saved the piers and pilings underneath, and, and we'll build this new deck that's on top. If you went up to the river today, this is what you'd see, um, the remaining old piers from the bridge park itself. Our four goals, um, as I mentioned, is, is um, re-engaging residents with the river, improving public health, reconnecting long divided neighborhoods, and something I'll talk more about in just a second. How do we make sure that we're not just an anchor for economic development, but we're an anchor for equitable and inclusive growth? So when I started this, and it's been about 10 years, so I heard earlier um, that these projects usually take about 10 years. I don't know why that's a magic number, but that's been the case for us. Um, we, before we engaged any engineers or architects, um, uh, we went to the community. We spent two years just talking to local residents, um, saying, what do you think? Is this a good idea, bad idea? Do you want the bridge park? Not. 
Um, and once we heard there was some enthusiasm for the project, we said, all right, well then help us shape it. Help us make sure that every programming element that's on that park comes from local residents. And, and we heard all of these different programming ideas um, in 2012 and 13 that allowed us to launch a larger nationwide design competition. Um, the, we engaged the community and local residents and stakeholders as part of the design competition. Um, a group of about three dozen residents um, reviewed the design brief, our, our real Bible, um, the, for how the design competition was gonna be run, made some significant edits. And then they met with our uh, teams. Um, the, we had 81 teams from across the country um, formally apply. And they met with our four final teams at multiple times during the design process to provide feedback. And at the end of eight months, um, they selected the design team. So um, much of our work has evolved as I, would I wouldn't describe it then, but I would describe it now is how do we put decision-making power back into the hands of local residents? So I didn't get to choose the design team, um, the, the community did. And so the design that they were unanimous for um, and our, our formal design jury was this design by the architecture firm of OMA and the landscape architecture firm of Olin um, that reused the old piers to create two trusses that come together and meet in the middle, in essence, a sort of double-decked bridge. And I'll walk you very quickly through just our renderings. We'll, we'll be at 100% design this month. Um, a series of these community-driven programming spaces throughout the park that makes way for rain gardens as you enter and from the Navy Yard, we're capturing all the stormwater uh, that lands on the park and the giant cisterns for irrigation on either end. Um, these overlooks with these amazing views of the nation's capital, a hammock grove, a place not only of physical well-being, but mental health and relaxation. A center plaza that we call Anacquash Plaza after the original Native American inhabitants, the Nkokchenk. Community meeting spaces and cafe, great lawn on top of the cafe, views looking east of the river off the um, end of the truss, um, the looking out over the hills of Anacostia, an intergenerational play space. Anchoring east of the river, it will be an environmental education center that will um, that will be run by our partners at the Anacostia Watershed Society, uh, inspiring the next generation of river stewards with access to um, the a kayak and canoe launch east of the river. Urban agriculture, our ninth bridge park plot, as we call them, for a neighborhood that has uh, one grocery store serving 75,000 people, um, huge food justice issue. And then a performance space, a 250 person amphitheater um, the, uh, that has the river as a backdrop. And uh, the size of the park to give you a sense of scale is about three football fields stacked end to end to end. All told, it's about seven plus acres. So we'll be at 100% design um, the, this month, um, begin soliciting our contractor this fall with our partners at the District Department of Transportation break ground in early 2023 and an open in 2025. But I wanna spend the last few minutes talking a little bit about the investments that we're making in the bricks and mortar of the park, but also the investments um, the, that we're making in the nearby neighborhood. We know that these kind of signature spaces um, the, will um, be a real asset for the community, but also can have unintended consequences. Um, how do we make sure that the, the, the the same thousands, tens of thousands of residents who helped shape the park from the beginning be the ones that benefit from it. So we thought this is an opportunity not only to, you know, have this once in a lifetime opportunity to, to repurpose this old freeway bridge into a park, <clears throat> but how do we think, how do we flip the traditional development process on its head? How do we, instead of building the asset and then saying, whoops, pr home prices are, are, are rising and, and residents are being displaced, how do we first invest in the local neighborhood, the communities, the residents, and then and only then do we build the asset? So we looked at who lives and works within a one mile walk shed around the park. Because um, if we were making uh, suggestions of strategies to implement to ensure local residents can stay and thrive in place, it needed to be based on solid data. So data like housing prices, um, the um, household income and employment, um, and then we've done what we've done from the beginning, which is we spent a year in 2015 um, 
listening to the community, um, holding um, large public meetings, coming up with strategies in four key areas, affordable housing, uh, preservation of black owned businesses east of the river, workforce development, um, and then arts and culture strategies that manifested in our, uh, what we call it this equitable development plan that we uh, launched in um, our first version in December, 2015. And I'm not gonna go through all 34 strategies, but I do wanna mention just a few to give you a sense of, of what some of these strategies are. Um, we have started a, a home buyers club providing um, technical assistance, um, the credit score repair, down payment assistance, um, and to date, we've seen over 104 Ward 8 renters become homeowners, um, the capturing intergenerational wealth. We've stood up the Douglas Community Land Trust that now has over 250 units of permanently affordable housing that's owned by the community. If we're spending $90 million to build this park, how do we make sure that as much of those dollars go back into the local community. But to do that, we need to make sure that local residents have the skill set and capacity to apply for and succeed at these jobs. So we just graduated our 25th construction training program. And keep in mind, like we're not breaking ground until next year, but it's important to build that infrastructure, to build that strong muscle that's in the community now. Um, because to date, we've had over 150 East of the River residents um, be employed in construction jobs. So when the GC comes to us and says, well, I can't find any local residents to hire, we can say, well, here's a list of 150 plus residents um, to consider. So try again. We've invested, uh, it's now over a million dollars in uh, black owned businesses east of the river through low cost loans, technical assistance, helping to build websites. We're just about to launch a new program um, the, with um, the consulting firm Booz Allen to provide free technical assistance um, for a dozen black owned businesses along one of our commercial corridors. And then, you know, we could get the housing workforce and small business right, but if we lose what makes the east of the river communities unique to Anacostia and to Farallon, these local neighborhoods, that is enormous downstream consequences. So we um, have invested uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the in arts and culture programs, um, art installations, huge festivals that we put on every year and partner with local arts and cultural organizations um, to produce events. And the largest event that we do is our Anacostia River Festival um, that we've produced for the last eight years in a row. It brings about 10,000 people down to the river. And lastly, you know, the equitable development plan was never meant to be a organic or never meant to be a static document. It was always meant to be organic. Um, the, and when the pandemic hit, um, we anticipated that East of the River residents were going to be um, disproportionately impacted, um, which unfortunately has been the case, um, highest mortality in the city. So we partnered with three other nonprofits, um, Bread for the City, Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative, and um, the, um, the, the Martha's Table, and the um, three other amazing place-based NGOs um, to launch what's become the largest privately fund funded unconditional cash transfer program that's ever been attempted in the United States. We've raised over $4 million and distributed over three and a half million dollars direct cash grants to over 600 uh, East of the River families, along with weekly groceries and, and monthly dry goods and connecting them with navigators. And, and you know, what does a running an unconditional cash transfer program have to do with building a bridge? Kind of nothing but everything, right? Um, the, if we can strengthen the community well in advance, and to date we've been able to invest over $85 million with working with our partners in the nearby neighborhoods, nearly the same amount of money it's gonna to cost to build the park. We can strengthen that neighborhood, make it more resilient so those same residents who've been shaping this project from the beginning can benefit from it. A question that animates us often is who is this for? Um, and first and foremost, it needs to be for these long-term residents. Much more information can be found on our website at bridgepark.org. Um, and I am gonna stop there because I think I've gone over a couple of minutes, um, but happy to be around for the conversation. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks Scott. And I really appreciate uh, your being flexible with, uh, with your time. And um, uh, uh, there are a couple of questions that came in for you related to the uh, noise and pollution levels from the uh, nearby freeway. So uh, um, we're going to go to uh, to, to, the, to end this the presentation portion, our second keynote bookend, we'll go to Paul Angelone if you would like to, Scott, uh, go and, and, and address those, uh, those questions. Um, and uh, uh, in the meantime, Mr. Angelone is the Senior Director at the Urban Land Institute. 
uh, nonprofit education research organization that focuses on land use, real estate, and urban development. Uh, Paul actually leads the Curtis Infrastructure Initiative at ULI, which identifies and promotes infrastructure solutions that make cities more equitable, resilient, and that enhance long-term community value. I can see he's champing at the bit here to, uh, to get going, and uh, I think he'll uh, do a great job of building off of what we just heard from Scott. And we will have time for a uh, uh, live question and answer uh, once he is done. So uh, I will just turn it over to you, Paul. I, I will want to say one more thing, which is he has been a terrific partner throughout this research process. And uh, I need to give him some credit for uh, helping us uh, gain insight and, uh, and, and connect to speakers uh, for in developing the symposium as well. So Paul, really appreciate it. Uh, and it's all yours. Well, well, perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm really glad that everyone is able to be drawn, uh, brought together to have this really important conversation. And you mentioned who ULI is um, at the beginning, but I think one thing as we're really thinking about as we reconnect these divided communities, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge, um, particularly me, acknowledge the role that ULI um, has played in um, dividing some of these communities uh, throughout the years. And so we'll talk a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit more about how we actually kind of address the legacy of this infrastructure, as well as also uh, finance and fund on this work, but also ensure that uh, a lot of it is is uh, more equitable and, and definitely uh, better than what we did in the past. But uh, as you mentioned, um, I lead the Curtis Infrastructure Initiative, which is really focused on creating more equitable and resilient spaces that enhance long-term community value. And the way that um, I like to really think about this is how do we build a movement around um, uh, leveraging infrastructure investment to create these stronger communities? And the way that you do that is by um, uh, convening tables and creating new ones as needed, building capacity and technical assistance at the local level, and finally taking all of this information in great conversations like these to, to develop a feedback loop that kind of feedback into the broader conversation that we're having. Uh, so this is a constant uh, ongoing uh, conversation. But I do work for an organization that is predominantly a real estate-based organization, predominantly uh, private sector. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important that really hits on what Peter was talking about earlier was that, um, you know, real estate is really about people um, and then how those people experience, experience that place. And so a lot of the activities that we need to be doing, a really good high quality development are ones that really enhance and create a really awesome spaces that are fun and joyful and places that you want to be and remember as part of that. Then something else I think that's important is that transportation is a social experience. Uh, yes, there's lots of different things uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, the technical side of it that we need to talk about, but we don't just get uh, in our car or take a bus or bike uh, just for the fun of it. We're really doing it uh, for that social side of these things. And so I often take my daughter to work. Uh, to, to, I take my daughter to school. Um, often by bicycle, and that's a time that we like to have conversations about the day, of what's going on, um, and broader life challenges. So that experience, that transportation experience, whether it's on the bus, uh, uh, bicycle, or, or car, really is that conversation. And that's really how I view uh, transportation. And so again, it's really about the people that are using that space. Then finally, within all of this, um, how we uh, prioritize is really key. Um, so that means that the land use uh, that we do, the design matters in this effort. And one way to, to kind of focus some of the prioritization, uh, ULI uh, put together a, a broader strategy of thinking about asking its members of what were some of the key priorities for infrastructure. Um, also, we asked um, them what infrastructure means. Um, we had very little consensus uh, about what infrastructure is, but broadly speaking, it, it's really about, it's a framework for society really the framework for creating a community. But, but ultimately, some really key areas that I focus in on is really that, that idea of restorative infrastructure investment that's really necessary. And, and a lot of that's driven from uh, my work with uh, Keith Baker and others within Minnesota, that we really need to think about how do we um, restore and create these spaces that, that were divided through legacy infrastructure. And this means you know, uh, uh, highlighting and focusing equity as part of this, as well as also ensuring that there's financial sustainability as part of, uh, uh, as part of this process. Thinking about um, you know, mobility and access is really key, uh, making sure that people have access to opportunities whether it's a social, um, economic, or work or play, whatever you really want to do, uh, being able to take part of that social transportation. 
we need to address the threat of climate change. And this is, isn't just for our children. This is really for ourselves. We, we see lots of these um, you know, extreme weather events ongoing. And so we really need to think about uh, how do we make sure that we have a, a thriving planet that we can all survive on. We need to increase affordable access to high quality internet. And finally, all infrastructure in these investments need to be focused around how do you create more housing affordability and attainability? Because the demand for all infrastructure is really focused around um, housing. And so really digging into what we're talking about here about mobility and access, um, you know, some of the questions that we need to be asking ourselves are really about uh, uh, how do we improve that mobility? So all of our design planning, uh, that NEPA process, everything about this is really thinking about how do we really create better um, outcomes and thinking about, uh, you know, transportation as a systematic uh, element. So um, infrastructure broadly is very systematic. So we really need to think about how do they integrate with our, all of our other plans, like our equity plans, our climate plans, our housing attainability and affordability plans, and really thinking about reducing uh, VM VMT. And then finally, I think it's really important to think about um, uh, a lot of times there's capital construction costs, but there isn't a lot of the, that operation and maintenance for longer term. So making sure that we plan for that going forward. But as, as the development, uh, the design process happens is really thinking about as if an urban highway is deemed to kind of remain as part of that process, it, that is determined to be really important, is we really need to think about how do we use that right of way. And so does that mean that we are going to allow private use within that right of way? Does that mean that we're going to keep all the uh, that right of way um, and use it for other uh, other uses? You know, you need to think about like, how do you move utilities or are there going to be buildings on the top of the right way? Do you have the right structures to allow for those things? Um, and then thinking about like all of this is is you know, maybe there's narrower caps or maybe there's bigger caps, but really, you know, creating flexibility, but really thinking about what's ultimately going to be going on to that, um, that use of that right away is really important as we're kind of going into that design process. It, and as I talk about caps, I really want to define a little bit about this. And so... Uh, one is a, a really great example of what I like to refer to as a stitch um, is actually um, is a project in Columbus, Ohio, that's uh, near Union Station. And what they did, you can see the image on the on the um, on the right there. Uh, that's actually a drawing of of, of, uh, of Austin, Texas, but really it's just making a, a, a bridge a little bit more enhanced. Sometimes it used park space, sometimes it used retail, sometimes it used other structures. So it really uh, allows for the visual um, experience of, of like you're staying on the same street. And so this, this was designed to uh, reconnect uh, um, um, uh, from their convention center downtown, uh, downtown Columbus, to a neighborhood called Short North, just on the other side of the interstate. And this was one of the, one of the first projects that really the Federal Highway Administration leased uh, for a dollar um, the right of way for this to be used for this, and then um, a private developer developed the a retail in partnership with, with the public sector in, in construction this roadway. Um, and then a cap really is that kind of that area in between um, those bridges. And so thinking about a great example is Terrelta Park in San Diego. Uh, this is in a neighborhood that um, really demanded um, access and open space as construction was being um, planned for the redevelopment of uh, the rebuilding of, of a highway there and really demanded that there be parks and open space within this community. And so one of the challenges right now is really thinking about the, the longer term operation and man maintenance of the space. But it's a really good example of what a cap could look like. Then finally, I think I'm going back to my hometown here uh, of really thinking about how do you start combining all these different elements and you can use them in different uh, ways. And so you have the stitches, you have the caps, really putting them together to kind of free up uh, a land around it. And so this is actually, the, the, this is an example of this Google map image is of the Capitol crossing in Washington, D.C., um, which is a, um, uh, which is an interesting uh, right away question because actually uh, Federal Highway Administri Administration um, uh, sold the right of way itself um, so that the, they no longer control the right of way. Um, and, it, and ultimately, a, a private developer, there's, there's a long history of it, but the private developer um, uh, was able to purchase it. And um, because of how it's financed, um, is uh, because of a long-term pension fund is looking at this as, as very long investment term. And so uh, the private uh, sector is really financing uh, to create new land. Um, and so uh, is a real opportunity to, to, to leverage the private sector to pay for uh, that will have, that has tremendous benefits. Um, and as I said, with my, my daughter biking, I now can actually bike uh, uh, through areas that otherwise would have been cut off by a divided highway. 
And so as we make these, um, these combining these elements, we can really leverage uh, the assets of parks or buildings or others to create a real opportunity. And so, uh, so that you can create some um, uh, co-benefits. And so this is a park in Kansas City uh, that's really thinking about uh, uh, leveraging this park space for um, economic revitalization and really using um, uh, the public sector to really spur development and, and bringing together, uh, thinking about different pots of money. So whether it's the Department of Public Works, whether it's the state, whether it's um, you know federal dollars, others really fund, um, you know, make sure that you know uh, cars are protecting people, uh, uh, new roadways, uh, new new walking uh, uh, bioswales and other natural systems. And then leveraging some of the land um, to build affordable housing. And then as this uh, investment's happening, then you can um, uh, that will help attract uh, private investment. And you can use um, some you can capture some of the value created. Uh, through some of these investments. And then there's a lot of federal money um, that's available right now. Um, the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, was a $1.2 trillion investment with about $570 billion or so of new dollars. Um, and one of them, I think, uh, really, you know, thinking about um, it's not as significant as it was initially proposed, but there are a, a real focus by the administration right now of thinking about um, how do you create shovel worthy, uh, not just shovel ready projects? And there's about a billion dollars to really think about a reconnecting divided communities, um, but also a lot of the other broader discretionary dollars that are out there. So there's about a billion for reconnecting these divided communities, but all these other uh, discretionary dollars can also, whether that's raise grants or others that can be helped directed to. And I think it's really important to really understand that a lot of these dollars are going directly to states. And so the state DOTs are directing a lot of this investment. So really being engaged with your state DOTs is important to help make sure that we prioritize these dollars more effectively. And one thing to note, it's not law yet, um, but about $3 billion was included in the recent climate and health bill um, that is, uh, that's going to be signed by President Biden. Um, and that's really additional, uh, uh, additional $3 billion to reconnect divided communities because this is such a critically important thing that we need to be focused on. And there's a real role for the, the real estate industry um, to really focus on this, to help uh, make sure that we address a lot of the, the disparities that capital um, has done, because often capital flows to those areas that um, uh, you know, are, are the, the easiest place to do investments. And so it takes a little bit of work to make sure that we allocate those resources in ways that actually uh, address a lot of these disparities um, that we that we've generated. And this this is an image uh, of Saint, of Ramsey County, uh, 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 Minnesota. Um, and you can this is a, a what this is is just an, um, a 3D visualization of tax assessments divided by acre. So you can see the different areas where the highest value of taxable land uh, that exists. So you can see downtowns, other uh, core neighborhood areas. And then further out, you can see some of the more suburban jurisdictions, but those areas, um, you know, uh, uh, the highest land values uh, uh, typically are those areas actually that the kind of the pre-World War II neighborhoods that are much more people-centric is really where um, a lot of the, the vast majority of the, the uh, values generated despite individual housing costs, uh, prices that sometimes look like they're in reverse. And this is really, um, can really be shown, um, you know, thinking about, this as uh, uh, historic uh, redlining and other different, um, you know, um, uh, you know, efforts that we've made uh, in the past. So this is uh, that same map overlaid with the Rondo neighborhood, um, and you can see those areas that are uh, rated in different levels. And this map is actually upside down, just so you know. So uh, south is to the north is up, and then uh, north is down. But you can see that the highway that runs through uh, Rondo really acts as a real barrier um, in terms of, of land value in different neighborhoods. And so just a way to look at how much value did that, um, that highway, what, what would it be worth today? So if you looked at the same value of what that Frogtown neighborhood was, the price per acre, the average, it looked like that that highway would be worth about $69, billion, $69 million in taxable value. If you look at it just as the land value to the south um, uh, along, I think, Grand Avenue, um, that would be, uh, we'd be worth about $178 million. And, and Reconnect Rondo did a really great prosperity study that it's really about $154 million that they, they estimated. So this is actually pretty close. 
And finally, uh, thinking about the value of different land uses, such as transit-oriented development or people-oriented tra uh, 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 transit as what it could be is is if everything was the same value as the light rail station next to the green line, it'd be worth about two hundred eighty six million dollars. But I think it's really important to really uh, as you're making you're implementing these projects and, and incorporating to the upfront, it's really thinking about how do we make sure that those who are most impacted by the decisions are the ones that actually uh, have a lot more deci decision making power. So often you have. Um, uh, you know, the developer or st uh, local fix officials, state agencies, others they usually have more decision making power, but they're often not the most impacted of, uh, impacted of these. So really, how do we make sure that we bring residents and others into uh, this decision making? And it's really um, important to think about that. And as you're making these, these long term investments, whether 10, 15, 20, 30 years, um, is really thinking, make sure that that um, there isn't a, a ton of planning fatigue and others by making sure that there's a lot of activation. Something I think, you know, Scott didn't really talk about a lot, but they, I mean, they've done so many meetings and so many engagements and so many activities, really uh, making sure that you could see, um, even if the bridge was never actually built, it would be widely successful projects. So really showing that there's a lot of uh, outcomes and opportunity happening. And finally, I think this really gets to some uh, some ways of actually paying and financing these things, such as just looking at that that final one was just really, you know, this is something that can be a public-private partnerships or people-centric uh, uh, partnerships that can happen. Um, but really, there's a there's a real opportunity for either the, the private sector to be the, the predominantly leader in doing this, or in other cases, really having the public sector lead. But ultimately, as we make sure that process, the financing and funding can really fall into place. Um, that really is about running different numbers and really looking at outcomes, but we can generate the values to create these things. But it's really, I think, about that upfront uh, uh, work as we're doing this. So I uh, just want to say thank you and, and really look forward to the rest of the conversation and discussion. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, thanks to everyone for um, uh, staying in with us as we uh, have put out, uh, um, as I said, it could have been eight hours of presentations. Um, and instead, we went with the with the virtual firehose. But uh, it, it's generated some great questions, uh, uh, all of which have had some answers already um, uh, typed into the Q and A. Uh, if there are questions that anyone has uh, of the speakers at this time, please feel free to type those in, and uh, we'll try to address those live. Uh, while we're waiting to see if any of those come in, um, one uh, set of questions that came in kind of uh, just as we were getting started. Uh, asked about um, how, how do these projects, if at all, acknowledge the role of, of racism in preventing access and opportunity and, uh, and address land use decisions that limited uh, where uh, in cities uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color uh, could live and the jobs they were permitted to hold. Uh, so if, if uh, any of the panelists uh, have some thoughts about that, um, we'll uh, uh, open to that answering that at this time. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in, Frank. Um, I mean, it is critical to the work that we're doing. There's an 81 times difference between the average household wealth of black families and white families in DC. 81 times, right? I first read that in a Georgetown study a few years ago and thought there had to be a typo, but that is directly connected to the legacy of racism um, that is so baked into the larger systems that are at play through a history of redlining, through a history of, of um, investment of, of where um, the companies and the government are investing. Um, I mean, a, a great two great examples of that. Um, west of the river, half of the um, residents there are homeowners. East of the river, 75% are renters, right? At greatest risk of displacement. In the Anacostia Business Improvement District, there's 104 businesses and only three of them own their own properties, right? So this is the sort of deep inequities that um, the, are decades in the making um, the, that we're trying to address through this larger, um, the, through the Bridge Parks Equitable Development Plan. Great, That's a terrific answer, Scott. Uh, uh, any other uh, speakers to that question? Uh, Paul already posted a, a document from ULI that uh, folks uh, can, can access uh, to, to also look at that, answering that question. And, and I think I think there's something that is also just making sure that we're thinking about, um, you know, how we actually finance and fund a lot of this work um, in some of these neighborhoods too, particularly showing that there's a lot of value um, that can be uh, generated um, through this work. So making sure that, um, you know, working with lots of different partners like 
you know, setting up those community uh, development uh, land trusts, working with community development finance institutions, working with lots of different institutions to start uh, uh, proving that there is a market so that other capital can start coming into a, a neighborhood. And I know that, um, you know, there's there's always a, a kind of a, a uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're you know, making sure that we're, we're not uh, displacing people are there, but also, um, also, but we still need to have investment in these communities. And so, um, because poverty is also uh, causes displacement. And so really thinking about how do we increase wealth and opportunity? Um, and, and, and I think it's really important that we, um, you know, just make sure that, that, we address a lot of those capital flows uh, in, in, into these neighborhoods and, and really create opportunities that way. So, so you know, there were lots of examples of projects that just have really struggled. That they're creating some really exciting opportunities for generating wealth within communities. Whether it's um, a lot of uh, you know, uh, you know, community ownership in in you know, Chicago uh, strip malls. Uh, there's a really great project in Oklahoma City that's looking at um, you know, as real uh, as retail or other restaurant invest in their project they actually can get um you know a benefit actually from uh, when there's actually wealth growth in the community or even just allowing for people to purchase homes um prior to actually so that they can take part in some of this value uh, generated i think that's just really um important uh, to, to think about too great thanks so much paul uh peter i saw you uh brought your your video up is this do you want to yeah. respond yeah, I you know I I think this is this is a really important question and and there's a there's another question I think later um, uh, that Caitlin raises about uh, concern of gentrification and I think so the framing of the conversation of the opportunity is a really a, we have to carefully very carefully and with community define right what the opportunity is. Uh, I've worked uh, with different communities who, you know, there was a desire by some who wanted to remove a freeway and then a desire by others that they didn't want it to be removed. They fully understood the impact that this freeway had on their neighborhood in terms of higher rates of childhood asthma, in terms of the, the lower land value and lower rise of land values. But what they saw and what they feared is if it was improved, then they would be gone, right? And so the balance here is something that has to be addressed from the very beginning of any of these conversations. Because I think there's nothing more sad to me than a neighborhood advocating for a value depressing, polluting piece of infrastructure to protect themselves, right? To protect themselves from being displaced. So I think one of the things that is important is recognizing and understanding, especially the, you know, the points that Paul has brought up, Scott has brought up, there's land there, right? And the basis in land, the cost of the land in any development equation is not inconsequential to the development, right? Um, but it's an important one to think about if we think about the creative use of right of way and rights of way that we can vacate, where does the land go? How much does it take you know, for that land transfer to occur? And I think one of the important things, I mean, um, Paul, you, you mentioned Columbus, right? I, you know, there's a $1 lease uh, in Columbus, right? For the, for the, for the duck. I mean, the, the cost of the land um, and making it available for affordable housing, for local business, like a whole range of things can happen if um, the land transfer from the Fed actually goes to a local entity that can use that lower basis in the land as a way of underwriting and filling gaps, right? Um, but that's, a, that's an opportunity that I think that we can't forget about. Um, not only in terms of how we engage communities, but at, but actually looking at what that additional right of way or vacated right of way might have to offer for improving communities. Great, and Liana, this is getting to me at this time of day. Liana, I know how to pronounce your name. Uh, you've uh, you've unmuted and brought up your camera. I'll uh, turn it to you. 
Yeah, um, it'd be silly for me to not um, comment on this. Uh, Gloria, it's the right question to ask. Um, Peter, you are a thousand percent correct. It's very much neighborhood focused. Um, and Jake, you asked a question in the Q&A around why it is that Sweet Arbor Works organize itself as a main street. Well, you know, we don't use a lot of language of displacement and gentrification necessarily, um, just as, as a matter of context. Um, this neighborhood is still more than 50% African-American institution and individual um, uh, owned. So when the entity was organized, again, private Main Street program, it was so that this neighborhood could be in control of reintegrating capital and people and culture back into this neighborhood. Um, the control is the only issue of substance in this conversation. Right, and if you don't have the ability to do that, then you're left at the women fancy of someone else um, who's attempting to do those same things. Um, from a real estate perspective, um, your the empathy that comes with a real estate development has everything to do with the owner. And so, you know, a lot of the language that we use in this in this town is, you know, my highest and best use isn't necessarily your highest and best use. Um, and there's a there there's an there's a remarkable level of intentionality that goes into um, where uh, redevelopment capital goes to and to what owner and for what purpose. Um, that again, this organization and like-minded landowning institutions and development partners um, move in one step and one accord with uh, for the redevelopment of, of this process. And and to Peter's point, you know, if there's new opportunity from a real estate perspective created from mitigating against this infrastructure in our neighborhoods that has to be at the control of the neighborhood and not any other external entity stop there Frank. great thanks liano um i i'm getting some some feedback that uh, uh not all questions are necessarily um visible uh to folks uh, for which uh, I apologize. Uh, I'm doing my best to monitor and I'm able to see those questions, but uh, Zoom is, it's still not uh, live and in person. So um, we, we will uh, be recording um, at this whole event. We, we, uh, I believe we will be uh, connect, collecting the, the Q&A information and we will redistribute all the links that, uh, that folks have posted. So hopefully that will uh, uh, provide some answers. Um, at this time, I, I would like to uh, roll along to um, getting a chance to talk about what uh, Maya and I have learned as part of this uh, this research, um, and uh, and and then uh, we'll have time for some more feedback uh, after that. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully, this will be something that. Uh, um, shows uh, we've picked up some cross-cutting lessons, uh, possibly some, some new insights. Um, and uh, and, and uh, then uh, we'll, we'll uh, return to, to more of these uh, more, more Q and A. So uh, we will now uh, challenge myself to uh, share my own screen. And that will entail also getting the slides fully up. Yeah, we'll try a different screen. There, is that uh, a better a better view of uh, the large slides, everyone? Looks great. Great, thank you. So, um, we looked at uh, the uh, the three cases that were uh, discussed today, uh, as well as uh, five other ones that I mentioned earlier and some of which were also discussed uh, earlier today. And uh, um, 
Uh, we didn't actually put my bio up there, so I'll give you a quick background, which is that uh, I am trained uh, primarily as an attorney, and I've been working in transportation policy impacts uh, for the last uh, 20 years. And um, what that means is when it comes to doing visual things, I'm pretty darn simple. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, summary of, of what we learned. X is actually good, a best practice. Uh, the carrot is where we saw that uh, the best practice is there, but it's not necessarily um, uh, one that we would recommend. And uh, the zeros are, are cautionary tales. Uh, and we, we did find a few of those uh, as we went along as well. Uh, the other part about being trained as an attorney is I always uh, claim that I, uh, it's my responsibility to do a slide that is, at least one slide that is almost impossible to read, and that would be this one if you're trying to read those best practices along the left side. Uh, we'll instead go through them one by one. Um, the first one is, uh, it, it, this is my language, infrastructure can cause community wounds, but infrastructure itself cannot heal them. Uh, in other words, we... Uh, Frank, sorry, uh, could you try resharing your screen and maybe hitting play from beginning? I don't think it's advancing it's for us. Advancing? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's try this. Uh, we'll stop the share. We will reshare. Try this one. All right, is that uh, more visible to everyone? Can you see infrastructure can cause community wounds? It's great. Okay, I will bounce back quickly to uh, the previous slide um, showing the, uh, the overall matrix uh, comparing uh, these, uh, these various cases. Uh, I'll just point out again, um, actually what we do see here is that uh, uh, Milwaukee and the 11th Street Bridge ended up being some of the uh, the most positive best practices that we've seen, but there were lessons that we picked up from uh, nearly every case. So uh, back to this first lesson learned. Um, one thing is uh, a lot of these ca these cases come from situations where um, infrastructure caused uh, the the issues that we see. Uh, urban freeway put into uh, and run through an existing neighborhood. Um, in many of these cases, uh, the fix for the harm cause was also infrastructure, um, whether that is a cap or uh, a freeway removal or, uh, or you name it. Um, and only in a few situations did we see that actually led to you know, what we would consider successful results. Um, in part, uh, this is due to uh, what we call uh, in, in, in public policy speak, uh, government failure, uh, where the fact that if you have an infrastructure agency trying to fix uh, an infra a, a community problem, uh, you uh, end up with uh, an imper imperfect result. Uh, places where we see that, uh, uh, one was in, in New Orleans, where the community spoke and said they wanted to see a freeway removed. Uh, the response was, uh, we'll do something uh, under, the, under the freeway bridge. And what, when we started to look into that, we discovered there's, there's a stalemate. Um, in a couple of cases with Denver and Pittsburgh, we see uh, some caps were put in uh, and uh, that has not uh, been fully embraced by the community. Uh, again, this is a situation where we saw uh, uh, agency being the lead. The other lesson uh, that come that that that's that's hidden in here is the idea that trying to and Peter Park hit on this earlier. Um, focus on the solution. Look at the, the 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 design before understanding what the problem is to be addressed. And so uh, that also is the, is is um, something we'll talk about in, in future lessons learned. But I want to point out that if one starts by trying to uh, sell a vision rather than understand what is the community's vision, uh, you will likely uh, run into some problems. Um, the, the next lesson learned is uh, kind of the, the opposite side of the same coin. And uh, uh, this is what we were really found to be uh, uh, most interesting in 
in Milwaukee, uh, although we also saw it somewhat extent in, uh, in Oregon with their solar panels and, and, uh, and with Denver. Um, essentially, said the attorney, we need to point out that uh, federal funds used uh, for transportation facilities must serve a public highway purpose. Uh, what we need to recognize is that that does not need to be the only purpose. And as we heard in the presentation from the Wisconsin DOT folks, they have uh, connected with uh, community partners and so forth to recognize what else could be done uh, in these areas. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, that is uh, something, again, where we think it's uh, really important to get the dialogue going long before there is a, a decision, that the community can articulate what they want, and then the infrastructure folks can work to develop a solution that meets that. That is where you can get success. Um, the, uh, the cautionary tale here, again, go, we go to New Orleans where we, we saw that uh, the community spoke one thing and the response from the, the uh, government folks was not uh, one that was consistent with what they were told. And again, we ended up in a stalemate. Um, and with that, uh, we've probably heard quite a bit um, from me and uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Maya for some discussion. Thanks, Frank. Um, this next lesson really, uh, built off of what Frank was talking about. Um, we really saw the projects that had some success really took advantage of these right away use agreements and utility accommodations in a really creative way. Um, it's worth noting that they can do this while uh, keeping the core use of the highway intact. Um, Oregon is very notable here as they're the first DOT in the nation to implement their solar gardens in 2008. And that was through a right of way use agreement. Um, that provides environmentally friendly renewable lighting, reduces their carbon footprint. And Milwaukee, as we heard, uh, continues to utilize some creative right-of-way agreements to expand the uses of space and bring people together. And as Paul mentioned in his keynote, uh, the Capital Crossing Project is also very innovative and can do can implement a lot of green practices, ample housing, and mixed-use mixed use buildings within their project boundaries as a result of having kind of complete ownership of the land and airspace outright. Um, next slide, please. And one of the key areas Frank and I researched was how well these projects engaged the surrounding community in their efforts. And we found that really purposeful engagement um, throughout the planning stages, the building, and the beyond the project uh, really promoted engagement throughout the community and uh, led to a lot of embracing for the project and they saw it as an amenity. Um, some case studies we've wanted to talk about with that uh, point would be Denver. Um, their engagement through the project um, was reportedly not a strength. Uh, residents of the Elyria Swansea neighborhood kind of felt the project for the disenfranchised them after feedback was not really taken into consideration. It is worth highlighting that the end result of their health impact assessment, um, thanks to their strong advocacy efforts and lawsuits, uh, was, an in in, was an innovative success and appears to be an up and coming best practice. And in Pittsburgh, um, a lack of kind of community engagement after the project was completed left unanswered questions for future programming that would really bring people together, make use of the space and connect people to this cap. Um, and some good examples of community engagement include the Atlanta Underbridge. Uh, there was strong engagement there around placemaking and highlighting the historical significance of the space itself. And as we heard, the 11th Street Bridge Project uh, has done an amazing job really connecting with the community and promoting their initiatives, uh, unity around common goals and reinforcing uh, prolonged investment into the project itself. And back to Frank for the next couple. Great, uh, and thanks so much, Maya. Appreciate the chance to catch my breath. Um, I did notice there was a, a question about when there will be a break. We will uh, uh, have a moment uh, after we, uh, uh, when we go to get some feedback where folks can uh, take a break and be confident they're not going to miss anything. But uh, also, um, as I mentioned, we are recording this. So uh, uh, if you do miss anything, we'll have a chance to, to get, let you get caught up if you need to step away from your computer. Uh, the next lesson learned, uh, have a visible and transparent governance process. 
Um, this builds upon uh, kind of what we heard, what Maya just mentioned with Pittsburgh. Um, uh, the the idea is that uh, you uh, can do a very good job of outreach at the beginning, but uh, the project has a much longer life. And so if there is a visible and transparent governance process that helps the public understand who continues to lead the project, how decisions are made and how to get involved in that, that process. Uh, we mentioned uh, Pittsburgh is a cautionary uh, tale just now. Um, uh, once the project was done, there does, the, the community does not quite know how they can uh, continue to, to have input. Uh, Denver uh, is a situation where um, the community finally had input after they resorted to, to filing lawsuits. Um, that, you know, when, when the court system is the most transparent process you have, that probably means it's not very transparent. Uh, other best practices, we heard about the, the 11th Street Bridge, and I also want to give a shout out to uh, Liano's group in Atlanta, uh, which uh, really has made itself a visible uh, organization uh, to advocate for the, the interests of, of the neighborhood around uh, that transportation facility. Then we'll close with a couple of finance best practices. Uh, one is to ensure that uh, the funds, the, the revenues, the economic investment actually returns to the community where this facility is being invested. That seems intuitive, right? Well, if one thinks about uh, the construction of urban highways uh, back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, that caused the uh, investment and the, the money to flow away. Uh, away from those communities where those, those freeways were built. So we looked for examples where this actually did happen. Um, as Peter Park and, and the, the folks from Wisconsin mentioned in Milwaukee, um, the, particularly Park East, but also some of those other situations, Chris French mentioned, he's, on, he's one of the guys who actually brings money in. Um, uh, think about how the, uh, the infrastructure investment can, can reduce other expenditures or in, and or increase revenue. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, in Denver, um, they're, they're building a cap over uh, Central I-70, but uh, the real benefit back to the community, uh, and again, this took a lawsuit, but it's a practice that I think can be replicated without the lawsuit, is uh, investing in a health impact assessment, finding out what is the impact on the surrounding community in, a, in an objective way. Uh, and then the 11th Street Bridge goes one step further, uh, creating structures uh, that uh, can ward off property value increases and in gentrification. For example, uh, land trust uh, uh, was mentioned by Scott um, and, uh, and directing the investments toward the needs and interests of the residents uh, as they articulate them. And then finally, uh, this one's a, a, a little bit uh, technical, um, but it's uh, highly important. Uh, in, in the Park East example, um, that's removal of a transportation facility. To go back to uh, the law that uh, federal funds must be spent in support of public highway purposes. So if you remove the highway, do you need to give that money for, that was spent to uh, build that piece of infrastructure back to the federal government? And one really uh, interesting innovation that came out of Milwaukee was that they showed in this example uh, that removal of the freeway actually eased congestion. And uh, this, this, I think, is why we saw those highway guys so, be so uh, happy to talk about uh, the particular project because it advanced not only the interests of the community, but the interests of, of the transportation folks and uh, had the corollary of FHWA agreeing, indeed, uh, this expenditure is still for uh, at least transportation purposes and arguably public, public highway purposes. Uh, and that was what was accepted there. And so those are our lessons. Um, uh, like, like everything today, we're, we're moving very, very quickly. Um, but uh, the, I, I think the, the good news is, is that uh, this may be the um, last part where we're actually providing new information. Uh, we will now have a couple, we'll close with a couple of reaction presentations. But uh, if you go to uh, the URL uh, at number four here, 
z.umn.edu slash innovrow, I-N-N-O-V-R-O-W. It should take you to a Qualtrics survey uh, where you'll be asked to answer these three questions. Um, you have a chance to uh, rank box and rank uh, the lessons learned as we propose them, as you found them to be interesting. Uh, then a couple open-ended questions as to what is the most interesting information you've picked up overall today? And uh, what, if anything, will you take away or do differently when approaching right-of-way planning? So we'll take a few minutes here uh, to, um, to let you fill that out. Uh, I will then uh, take that information and uh, return it to another PowerPoint presentation, unfortunately, but uh, it will just be a few graphs. Um, and uh, in the meantime, uh, this is a chance to take a break, and uh, also uh, we can do a little bit more Q&A here. Um, so there's our contact information if you would like to get in touch with us for a, a, a longer conversation. Uh, and uh, uh, I will uh, open it up again back to the planners. There was a question, or excuse me, the panelists, a question about what is the role of overall city and regional planning in relationship to neighborhood planning as uh, we've heard a lot about today? I, I just wanted to add, uh, as you were talking about the the, the Colorado, the Denver one about um, the litigation. I'm not going to comment on litigation, but but I think something that's really interesting that co the state of Colorado has been doing is really thinking about, um, you know, how how do uh, transportation planners and others really do some of that modeling of traffic modeling and what does it look like, and um, and maybe because it is because of that litigation as well as a lot of other um, uh, factors, uh, the you know the state of Colorado. Uh, Put together a really interesting um, uh, rulemaking process that really takes greenhouse gas um, into consideration generated by induced demand and the increase of vehicle miles traveled. And so, uh, and they're looking at, I think there are four or five MPOs um, regionally, uh, statewide, are really taking that into consideration for a lot of, uh, of their transportation decision making uh, process. And so, what is uh, one of the you know, things I saw a quick story today that Peter actually could probably talk to more about. Um, but I think it's it's really enabled some some highways actually not be built or not expanded at all, which I think, you know, kind of relates back to how do you, you know, think about these broader systematic approaches? And then what type of ways do we, you know, how do we move people? Um, and how do we create more access and opportunity? And so because we need to think about transportation as a system. So it's just one state rulemaking process that I think is really um, exciting and really interesting. So I don't know, Peter, if you have anything more to add or something even more, you know, important to, to mention. <laughs> well, I, so both to address the Ellen's question, but also to uh, run with with the point that you made, Paul, you know, I think I think the the pieces that 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 this work identifies in terms of innovation is really important for all of us to talk about uh, uh, because because right changing changing some of the basic systems that we have in place uh, related to the decision process. So for example, NEPA, like we understand where NEPA came from. We understand right, the purpose, the public purpose of understanding the impacts of our decisions. But at the same time, it's sort of like uh, we have uh, the study area is too often too limited in terms of understanding, well, what those impacts might be, right? So the boundaries, for example, so I, I was part of the I-70 conversation and actually part of a group and my students at the university, right, we came up with an alternative to what was done. Uh, so instead of capping a freeway, widening a freeway, putting it uh, in, in deeper into the ground, which last week we had a terrible flooding event because and the pumps failed, right? So uh, it was a disaster. You can check it out in the news. Um, and it's a brand new facility, for God's sake, right? Um, it shouldn't happen. But but the thing is, is that we rely on, like we make a decision about the design and then we rely on a pump to solve the design, right? And when the pump fails, then the design fails. Um, there were other choices that, that could have been made about 
what the solution there was. I, my, my point is this, is that the space that the engineer, that the planner, that the community has to study, to figure out what, the, what, the, what a good solution is, is too delimited by the boundaries of a study area. It's within the right of way, typically, or just a little bit beyond the right of way. Well, the impacts of a limited access highway have proven to be well beyond <laughs> the study area, right? And so oftentimes, in the case of I-70, one of the solutions was actually to expand the capacity of a parallel highway uh, that didn't go through the same neighborhoods, went through primarily less used land and industrial land away from residential neighborhoods, uh, such that the traffic on I-70 could have actually been reduced and a, and a boulevard created, right? But the ability to study that as an option is very limited, is delimited by the fact that the study area, that was outside the study area, right? So it's a little bit of a ridiculous constraint that we have uh, in terms of finding our solutions when, when, when we can only look within the study area. The, the second thing I guess I would like to, to emphasize is that, you know, these, these criteria like NEPA are looking at the impacts of a decision, right? What we ought to be doing is figuring out how to change the criteria to say, how do we actually, in, how does the decision actually increase the opportunity? Not just, not just mitigate the impacts, right? Because mitigating the impacts is putting a pump. In, or mitigating the impacts is you know, putting up sound barriers or whatever, right? But, but you know, it reminds me of the situation of the man who goes to the doctor and says, Doc, I, ha I have all this pain. And the doctor says, well, tell me about it. Well, whenever I do this and then I do this and I bend this way, it hurts. And the doctor says, well, just don't do that, right? So, in other words, why do we, why do we make it more difficult? And so if we actually were to think about criteria and selection for funding to go to projects that actually have more opportunity, not just are really good at mitigating impacts, but have more opportunity for people, for the economy, for the environment, for the neighborhood, right? As well as the city as a whole. So this is where, to Ellen's question, city and regional planning have a lot to do with the relationship with what happens in neighborhoods and what happens at the overall system level. And to the extent that a city has a clear vision at a, you know, 30,000 foot level, at a larger level about its policies regarding growth and investment and its future of its people, then it can provide the overall framework for what happens throughout the different geographies of the city and the neighborhoods, right? And so for us, I think one, one of the lessons is the downtown plan in Milwaukee. It was a neighborhood plan downtown. But it did provide, and it supported the overall general policies of the city, um, but it also provided a vision for when that opportunity came for um, rethinking uh, a different solution for the Park East. Great. Thank, thank you, Peter. And um, we're getting uh, some answers coming in. I'll leave that open for uh, just a couple of more minutes. Um, and uh, while well, I'll give a snapshot of the answers uh, very shortly, um, when the webinar is over, you will again be prompted to go to that. Uh, if you had, did not have a chance to uh, fill out the survey, you'll have a, you'll be able you'll be prompted to go to uh, fill it out at that time, and uh, that'll help flesh out our overall answers. Um, I will ask one more question that just came in from from Caitlin. Uh, uh, which uh, was somewhat to Maya and me, but I think uh, our panelists can also answer this about uh, the primary funders of some of the successful efforts that we researched. Uh, she is, understands that highway project funding can be uh, fairly constricted. Uh, and, uh, and, and so therefore is wondering if there were some other uh, sources out there uh, that could be use, useful. And uh, I'm gonna first direct that one to Paul because you did touch on that, I believe, in, uh, toward the end of your presentation, but uh, we'll open to others as well. I'm sorry, I was actually reading uh, Gloria's question. So can you ask me the question again? A uh, question about uh, the funding sources for the most successful or, uh, sources or uh, projects that we researched. 
And oh. uh, you, you've mentioned there's a number of, uh, of sources that are emerging, uh, particularly out of recent legislation. Oh yeah, so uh, the, oh, thank you. Uh, so the, uh, at least with the federal government right now, um, there's about $100 billion discretionary dollar that the US Department of Transportation um, can fund. And there are really uh, some really interesting programs that they're doing right now, uh, particularly in partnership with HUD and other federal agencies is, is really, uh, there's a thriving communities initiative um, that is really looking to partner with um, uh, community members and others to really provide good opportunities. There's a, an emerging, um, uh, you know, the reconnecting uh, divided, uh, the, the reconnecting uh, pilots program is one that might be of interest to folks, uh, particularly on this call and others. Um, that's about $250 million uh, annually uh, for the next five years or so. And I don't know what the next, with the climate bill, how that's going to be added to it. So it's probably just going to be more. Um, and then, um, uh, and then there's also something I think to really think about is you can really leverage a lot of that federal dollars that's funded through the state DOTs that can be allocated to some of this work um, as well. So I think that's important that that the states have a lot of flexibility in how funding can be uh, used. Um, and so really uh, states can fund some of these things, but there's a lot of good uh, not for profits. There's lots of uh, uh, coalitions that are being formed, such as Communities First uh, Infrastructure Alliance that is uh, ULI is a part of, as well as I think like 50, 60 other uh, national and local organizations uh, as part of that. So there's a lot of different groups and coalitions that I'm more than happy to talk to anyone uh, offline about um, to really find uh, and identify funding to get this work done. Um, and I think we can really um, you know figure this out and, and can come from lots of different Great, thank you, Paul. Um, any other uh, panelists want to uh, comment on that that question? Right, Frank. I just might just you know in Milwaukee as uh, as the Wichita folks mentioned, right? We, we had the uh, the iced tea money. Um, I think it was about twenty five million in total. Uh, but the city of Milwaukee created a tax increment district, a TIF uh, district, which I think was about. $45 million, right, to help pay for the infrastructure uh, as well as um, uh, uh, assist in various developments. Again, it was along the Milwaukee River, um, had some brownfield sites, a number of other things. So uh, I, I think the Milwaukee case is a good example of, of a city lever leveraging, right, the, the funds uh, from uh, federal and state uh, 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 resources as well as right, putting their own money in the game, if you will, to help to uh, guide and accelerate investment um, in the area. Great, uh, thanks, thanks so much. Um, so we uh, uh, have the um, the results as uh, folks have been able to get them in. Um, Again, my computer is wanting to uh, show the uh, the minimalist version here of um, the slides. We'll see if I can uh, flip that quickly. And uh, get something larger. Uh, we'll need to do a new share. Let's see how that shows up. Great. So when it came to, to ranking, uh, we see that uh, um, the critical to success uh, of uh, the, those participating today say that uh, engage and address the interests of the local surrounding communities is uh, the most important. Um, also receiving uh, a number of votes in this uh, category are uh, visible and transparent governance process and uh, infrastructure can uh, cause community wounds, but infrastructure itself cannot heal them. Uh, then second most important uh, pra good practices to uh, observe are that the changes cannot be at the expense of the transportation purpose, uh, taking advantage of the right-of-way use agreements, utility accommodations, and other federal uh, innovations, uh, as well as um, uh, in ensuring the funds return the to the community. So that's uh, the first snapshot there. Then asking uh, the most interesting piece of uh, information you receive you heard today, well, transportation was a, a big deal. That's probably not a surprise, um, but uh, also the just the case studies at the city level um, came out. And uh, so we've got some uh, answers here, the Atlanta and Milwaukee presentations. 
uh, emphasis on private investment. Uh, that transportation engineers are listening and noting this work can actually decrease congestion uh, came out there. Um, uh, FHWA willing to, re, uh, to waive return of dollars, the case studies, and a shout out to uh, Peter Park, uh, uh, noting that city planning plays a vital role in the mode of uh, in all modes of transportation. And then, uh, what will be take? What will folks take away? Um, I will think more carefully about how the community defines the problem. Opportunities can vary by the size of impacts and the ability to mitigate. Encourage and require more expansive community engagement as early as possible. Uh, state DOT planners should be more like city planners. We must care about people and places. Um, uh, I, I'm going to put a note out there for Cyrus, who uh, uh, is, will be a state DOT person talking at the end uh, on that one. Uh, everybody points a finger at somebody else. Get people at the table to the table to discuss. Uh, I think that's a, a very important point. Um, and uh, being bold when advocating for community-centered innovation and government process uh, creatively and being more proactive when reaching out to the community with their visions uh, for the area. So I want to thank everybody uh, for, for that. Um, try to keep ourselves somewhat on time here to uh, close right around three o'clock uh, central uh, and uh, turn it over to, uh, to Keith Baker. Uh, who is the executive director of uh, Reconnect Rondo, um, which is a umbrella advocacy organization uh, committed to addressing racial disparities in Minnesota. Uh, he's leading the organization's missions to revitalize the Rondo community. Uh, and uh, while they have uh, landed on a land bridge, I would be very interested in his perspective of what he's heard today and how that uh, reflects his experience uh, in the uh, Reconnect Rondo work um, uh, to the extent he can do so in, in, uh, in just a few minutes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, thanks a lot, Frank. And thanks for just an incredibly rich uh, conversation and set of presentations uh, that have been given and some wonderful insights equally. Can you see my screen okay? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, yes. Um, you might want to hit uh, present slideshow. Yeah, you got, got it. it. So uh, actually, you know, I just want to thank Peter for really setting some some context to this. This has really been extraordinary in a number of ways. And uh, as well as really hearing about the Sweet Auburn project as well, because it really took a Main Street idea and now is beginning to kind of point it in a direction that is about larger infrastructure attention. Uh, certainly, Paul. Uh, work with us through ULI has been very, very helpful. And Scott's um, information with respects to 11th Street Bridge. It's good to see the contrast in the approach uh, that's been put forward. I'm not sure whether or not everyone fully has an understanding that there were two options that were situated for, um, you know, infrastructure investment during the Highway Act. And there was an intentional decision certainly to take it through the uh, Rondo community specifically. One of the things that's important to recognize is while, you know, um, certainly we think about the entire corridor, the rethinking I-94 corridor is St. Paul to Minneapolis or Minneapolis to St. Paul. So it's an incredible uh, area of about 7.5 uh, miles that really is being considered. The lens that we look at things, we wanted to make a business case, a technical case, a moral case, and a just case. And I heard much of that kind of emerge again you know, in various ways, but I don't know that there was any particular analysis on what the quantitative loss is. And I appreciate Paul uh, really pointing to and showing the, the uh, incredible economic gap that exists geographically in Ramsey County as a result of the freeway going through. But what I really wanna emphasize is had those homes not been taken, the value today would be $157 million. You can see the gutting of a community overall. Today, if we take a look at the average median income, we know the impact of the freeway uh, when compared that annual uh, median income to Rondo, there's a gap of $370 million. Again, that's annually. So we can see the direct impact of the freeway to the Rondo community. Our organization really is centered on uh, really connecting the Rondo community. 
really reigniting an African-American cultural enterprise district that was in fact Rondo once upon a time uh, prior to the freeway coming through. But we all understand the layers and the complexities whether we're talking about local jurisdictions, state DOTs, et cetera. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. But we do have an aspiration recognizing we've got residents within the community. We've got a nonprofit ecosystem. We've got jurisdictional relationships. We've got state relationships. We've got legislative relationships. And we can go all the way up to some of the federal discussion that's going on across the board. Our primary focus initially in our feasibility study was to focus in on five basic goals, neighborhood connections, housing affordability, equitable development, public health and green space, and community leadership. And community leadership being a very, very important foundational piece. When we think about the loss, who's leading, who leads matters. And I think about even the input in the last slide of responses talking about really authentic and important engagement within communities. So just recognize Reconnect Rondo is being driven by descendants of Rondo. Reconnect Rondo is being uh, led by those who have a more direct interest in this proposition. Um, so who leads does in fact matter. We landed on 21 acres of land through a process that we experienced with ULI in 2018. 21 acres of new land is possible with 13 acres of green space. We talked a lot about carbon reduction and, and really not designing necessarily for car movement, but we're designing more for communities, considering more around communities. Uh, and we thought that there was a tremendous asset uh, in leveraging the existing transportation system to really get at a wide range of community dynamics and community issues as the primary driver rather than transportation being the primary driver. I want to just emphasize a couple of things. We believe through our feasibility study, we can bring about 576 housing units. If we can imagine job creation, about 1,800 uh, jobs that can be created, nonprofit, retail space, and revenue to be generated across the board. But this in and of itself doesn't really paint the picture because sometimes it's viewed through a, a traditional development lens. Let me just frame for you the role of Reconnect Rondo overall and why we think it's so important in terms of that community engagement and community leadership. When we think about the role of Reconnect Rondo, we really are here setting conditions. We're setting conditions to access state and federal transportation resources. This is important to create new land that reignites an African-American cultural enterprise district. Again, we're talking about righting past wrongs, something that is able to protect residents and businesses in the neighborhood, actualize community and regional prosperity, and improve overall health and wellness outcomes for the community. I circled the Rondo Roundtable uh, portion of this. Again, we're governed by a board of directors. We're a nonprofit. We're engaging with all of the municipal partners under a project team. We've got a technical advisory team that helped us get to this particular point in time of experts around transportation and planning. You can see that we're really, really bent on how we're tied to communities and creating ideas and solutions at in terms of outcomes rather than really focusing in on transportation specifically. Let me just also highlight the importance of the work that we're engaged in tying into the city's comp plan, the Ramsey County Economic Competitiveness Plan, the Met Council's Thrive 2040. And for those that uh, don't know the Metropolitan Council, they are our MPO. And then taking a look at state and city uh, carbon reduction goals. But oftentimes the policies are right or the strategies are right, but the programmatic design is faulty. This is where communities can really speak to how those things can be corrected. If we're able to design the programs and be a part of the implementation process, we can find greater effectiveness overall. I know there's been a lot of conversation about how do things like this get financed? Well, we think about public, private, philanthropic and people. We've got program related investments that sit in our communities all the time. We understand public private partnerships, whether it's US Bank Stadium or Target Field here. Again, we subscribe to those, but what we also have to understand is those are the similar tools that can be used within communities when combined with an ability for people to invest as a primary beneficiary, as well as for philanthropy to lean in a little bit differently than I think it currently is leaned in. Combined, these two projects have been uh, 
investment in these two projects really are about approximately $700 million. Let's just talk about for a quick second, the timetable, because it's, got, it's important to recognize. And I think that Sweet Auburn has such a great sweet spot on this. And I think the 11th Street Bridge has such a great sweet spot on this, is it takes years of community engagement but it's gotta be rooted and grounded in those kinds of outcomes. I wanna really highlight for you the idea of a cap when it emerged. Again, it was post the freeway coming through, but that's as early as 2009. So when people talk about 10 years for a project to emerge, you can see where we are today uh, and where the first idea emerged. And it emerged because there were no stops along what we call the Central Light Rail Corridor along University Avenue for the community of Rondo. The light rail system was gonna bypass the Rondo community, which was yet another example of how infrastructure planning, transportation planning, transit planning, really did not uh, take into account the needs of communities within a geographic area. But I also wanna highlight that Rondo Roundtable, which emerged as well, because we see the Rondo Roundtable as a heartbeat of historical, African-American organizations that have been attempting to restitch and respond to the community in a wide range of ways. More formal apology came from then uh, Commissioner Zelly from Transportation, and then ultimately emerged from the city of St. Paul's former mayor, Mayor Coleman. You can see Reconnect Rondo did not emerge till 2017. So there's a lot of work that's taken place even before we've emerged as a formal organization, which I think is very, very critical. The other thing that I wanna emphasize in the black line that's pointing to the, to the right, purpose and need position paper. We needed to submit a position paper to the Department of Transportation. And that submission was intended to get folks to focus in on social, economic, and environmental concerns because the traditional way in which highway purpose is defined did not respond to our communities. And we've already heard various aspects of that in the presentations here today. So it was at that moment in time that we made a determination that we as an organization had to detach our segment of the project out of the rethinking I-94 process. In other words, we needed to take control over all aspects of the process for this segment of the 7.5 miles that I described a little bit earlier. I just wanna give you a visual of the geographic space. The land bridge being here, but I think Peter uh, in the latter part of his comments talked about the context, the larger community area, excuse me, the larger community area that has to be a part of the considerations of impact even though we're talking about a footprint of 21 acres over the freeway, we also know it has great effect not only in the geographic area outlined in orange, but each of these circles represents someone in the ecosystem. And so the question is, is how does the leveraging of transportation also help to amplify the existing ecosystem to resource the existing ecosystem and to protect the neighborhood's ecosystem overall. So we see a community building project, a restorative movement, if you will, using a transportation element. Again, how it's defined matters. And for us, it was important for us to do it that way. So as I think again about the long process from the 11th Street Bridge, the process and the defined context of the work of Sweet Auburn, even some of the work that has taken place along Claiborne, although there were some challenges associated with that, we see the early process of community ownership being principally critical in driving transportation investment. The other thing that I'd like to just uh, highlight is just give you a snapshot of where we are. And again, we as a nonprofit are driving the entire process. We're currently in, a, in the planning phase and financing phase. We're looking at certainly the larger neighborhood master plan, restorative development really has three component parts. How do we design a, 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 a circular economy? How do we think about urban regenerative-ism uh, or regenerative urbanism? How do we ensure smart cities technology looking out to 21st century solutions? is all a part of what we're driving. And then our anti-displacement and overlay. 
The anti-displacement and overlay study has three basic or four component parts. A, what does it mean to have a community reinvestment fund? B, what does a financing mechanism need to look like or include? What is anti-displacement tools that might be leveraged and used for um, ensuring that residential and commercial property is affordable? And then finally, what is, does a right to return framework look like? So you can see that we've thought very deeply and comprehensively on our project, again, leading an effort with a transportation element uh, as we're moving forward. And we do believe fundamentally that there are some important things to consider. Again, five basic goals that are, we're in pursuit of, establishing the local team, that's the technical side as well as our operations, really looking at activating master plan. And we're just starting that over the, la over the last couple of months. We've got incredible community engagement going on at this particular point. Certainly COVID had a tremendous implication, but we are really excited because we're gaining in tremendous enthusiasm about the project. And then taking a look at the neighborhood and ensuring, and I said, in that residential level, as well as the nonprofit level, because this is an ecosystem that has an opportunity for scalable change. Uh, and I think that we have a proposition that can really support. Again, confirming our partnerships with each of the jurisdictions becomes important, city, county, Met Council, and the Department of Transportation. And I believe the Department of Transportation has learned a lot from our leadership in this proposition. Uh, it's, it, it's as if we are upstream before they have decided what in fact they're going to do with the corridor. So we believe all of the considerations are being influenced by the work we're doing and then making sure we don't have the kinds of impacts that really have negative implications on the community. So I've heard some incredibly important and insightful uh, uh, points that have been made. I can't emphasize enough, Peter, you've set incredible context for this. And I also appreciate the sweet Auburn work that's been going on, uh, as well as that with the 11th Street Bridge. Um, keeping in mind, there are a lot of lessons learned, though, from those other illustrations. So, Frank, I appreciate the opportunity to provide a local perspective on this subject. Thanks so much, Keith. And uh, I want to thank everybody who is who's still with us. Uh, have, I'm still showing we've got uh, more than 50 people who have hung in for uh, right up to this point. And, uh, um, you know, on, on the one hand, we had a lessons learned of uh, infrastructure alone cannot fix the problem. So I wanted a, a local responder who was not from an infrastructure department. Uh, and, and, and Keith uh, did a wonderful job there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, to ensure that our work is uh, completed and, uh, and, and, and properly uh, posted according to the terms of the funding contract, we get to hear from Cyrus Knudsen uh, from the Community Connections Office at the MnDOT's Metro Division. Um, who is uh, the liaison uh, for this project. And uh, so Cyrus, uh, I'll give you the last word. Thank you very much, Frank. And I know we're over time, so I'm gonna make this brief and just try to emphasize a couple of things that I think are really critical that we perhaps all heard today. First, thank you to the, to the research team, Maya and Frank, and also the presenters today, and all those folks who spent their time and effort to inform the researchers in this, this endeavor. I think, there are two critical things that I think we all heard today, as I just said. One is the importance of working with community, listening to community, asking the community, those communities that have been harmed by, some, by a lot of our transportation infrastructure, what do they want? What do they need? What are the solutions they would like to see implemented? I think that's the place to start. To emphasize that, we're seeing community-led uh, uh, planning all over the country. Um, there was comments about visionary planning today. There was another related matters. I think those are tremendously important as we really think about how we're going to, as the state DOTs particularly are thinking about how we're going to deliver transportation service into the future that both meet those transportation needs of both providing the means of transit and delivery of goods and services, as well as, as, as people's social movements and other needs. The other is the partnership. State DOTs cannot do this alone. And I think that's been emphasized in everything we've heard today as well. I think as we really start to endeavor to create new and better partnerships, 
what we heard today is going to be tremendously important to us as we do that. And I think those are really, for me, the two things I think that were really absolutely critical to doing better, to not repeating the mistakes of the past. So I want to thank you all. And, uh, and again, and thanks to the to the also the folks who, who are still here with us, particularly with those who joined today, those who contributed to the questions and the commentary. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Cyrus, uh, and uh, you know, really appreciate uh, your support uh, and interest uh, in this work uh, as we've been uh, uh, moving forward with it. Um, I'm uh, just going to put up uh, the thank you slide one more time uh, for uh, anyone who um, uh, would like to uh, follow up with us. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to try to make sure that I've got it most visible. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, there will be a report coming out from this. Uh, we will be uh, fully drafting it and uh, working with MnDOT uh, to get it into a publication process. Um, uh, the, the contract uh, uh, will run right through next spring, uh, but uh, we uh, hope to have our findings posted uh, here at the University of Minnesota um, and, and finalized sooner than that. But uh, happy to uh, take questions uh, from folks uh, um, offline um, at any time at this point. Again, thank you all. And uh, we'll bring this uh, symposium to a close at this point. Thanks again.